Sehr geehrte Frau Mirtner, verehrte Damen und Herren, hier im Saal, Zuschauende am Livestream, herzlich willkommen ähm, in der Landesvertretung zu Baden-Württemberg. Künstliche Intelligenz und Resilienz. Nicht erst seit Beginn der Corona-Pandemie sind das zwei der großen Themen unserer Zeit. Sie haben durch die Corona-Pandemie noch einmal an Bedeutung gewonnen, ja, sogar einen richtigen Schub erfahren. Das Digitale ist durch Homeoffice, Online-Impfterminvergaben, Corona-Warn-Apps alltäglicher geworden und auch die Frage nach der Resilienz unseres Gesundheitssystems, unserer Wirtschaft und auch nach der individuellen Widerstandsfähigkeit. Resilienz ist in aller Munde. Insofern freue ich mich sehr, dass wir heute gemeinsam mit dem Espen Institute Germany und so vielen hochkarätigen Vertreterinnen und Vertretern aus Politik, Wirtschaft und Zivilgesellschaft diese beiden Themen in der Zusammenschau diskutieren können. Ihnen an nochmal ein herzliches Willkommen und eine gute Tagung hier. Künstliche, künstliche Intelligenz ist zweifelsfrei eine Schlüsseltechnologie für die großen Herausforderungen unserer Zeit. Da geht es um den Kampf gegen den Klimawandel, wenn es beispielsweise darum geht, bei der Energieversorgung aus erneuerbaren Energien die Netzstabilität zu gewährleisten. Da geht es um die Bekämpfung der Corona-Pandemie, wenn vernetzte Informationen über Bettenkapazitäten, Prognosen zum Infektionsgeschehen, die Gesundheitsversorgung der Bevölkerung und der Bürger und Bürgerinnen verbessern sollen. Und nicht zuletzt ähm, ist das Thema künstliche Intelligenz, Intelligenz ein großes Thema bei der Transformation der Wirtschaft, äh, wodurch eben diese Technologie in Prozessen natürliche Ressourcen, CO2-Emissionen und Energie eingespart werden. Eine insgesamt gigantische Wertschöpfungskette, die wir in Baden-Württemberg früh erkannt und früh gefördert haben. Und dabei ist uns die zukunftsgetriebene Forschung ebenso wichtig wie der konkrete Nutzen in der Gegenwart. Wir sind stolz, Europas größtes, größtes KI-Forschungszentrum und Forschungskonsortium zu beheimaten, das Cyber Valley. Ein weltweit hochgeachteter Spitzenstandort der KI-Forschung. Und hier bauen akademische und privatwirtschaftliche Partner Brücken zwischen der von Neugierde getriebenen Grundlagenforschung und der angewandten Forschung. 29 KI-Startups aus der Region zeigen im Cyber Valley Startup Network bereits heute, wie aus guten Ideen, eine innovative Praxis wird. Die Gründungskultur in der Wissenschaft wollen wir beibehalten und ausbauen. Auf diesen Erfolgen wollen wir aufbauen. Auch in Zukunft werden wir in Baden-Württemberg weiter tüchtig forschen, tüftern und erfinden. Das hat nun mal eine Tradition bei uns in Baden-Württemberg. Nirgendwo sonst wird so viel in Forschung und Entwicklung investiert, in Baden-Württemberg 5,8 Prozent des Bruttoinlandsprodukts Jahr für Jahr. Das Thema künstliche Intelligenz wird dabei auch in den kommenden Jahren ganz weit oben stehen. Denn das Feld ist ein umkämpfter Markt mit Blick auf Innovationen, aber auch mit Blick auf die klügsten Köpfe in diesem Bereich. Und daher freut es mich, dass wir den Ausbau des KI-Forschungszentrums Cyber Valley durch den Aufbau eines Alice Institutes durch Förderung der Hector-Stiftungen angehen werden. Und Mitte November hat die Haushaltskommission weitere 15 Millionen Euro bereitgestellt, mit denen ein zweiter Innovationspark Künstliche Intelligenz angestoßen werden soll. Meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren, es ist schön zu sehen, dass wir heute in einem so internationalen Rahmen zusammenkommen, denn auf diese internationale Kooperation wird es ankommen. Bei einer Schlüsseltechnologie dieser Größenordnung geht es nicht anders, bringen uns Alleingänge nicht weiter. International abgestimmte KI-Strategien, Ausbau internationaler und transatlantischer Kooperation sind unerlässlich und unsere demokratischen Strukturen können dabei zu unserer großen Stärke werden. Ein freier und offener Diskurs tut der Sache gut, 
So können wir, und davon bin ich überzeugt, gemeinsam das nötige Vertrauen gewinnen, um die Potenziale der Technologie voll auszuschöpfen. Lassen Sie uns heute mit dieser Konferenz und morgen einen weiteren Schritt in diese Richtung gehen. Ich freue mich auf den Austausch mit Ihnen. Herzlichen Dank. Madam Milner, ladies and gentlemen, viewers live stream from home, but ladies and gentlemen here in the hall, a very cordial welcome to you all. Artificial intelligence and resilience. These are two key issues of our time, and not just since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Indeed, the pandemic has made these issues more pressing and even acted as a catalyst. Digitization has become more commonplace through working from home, online vaccination bookings, and COVID-19 alert apps. And we are all addressing the question of whether our healthcare system, our economy, and we as individuals are resilient enough. So this is why I'm very pleased indeed to be discussing these two topics today together with the Aspen Institute Germany and so many leading representatives from politics, business and civil society. So again, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to you all and wish you a very productive conference. Artificial intelligence is undoubtedly a key technology in tackling the tremendous challenges of our time. So the battle against climate change, for example, and our need to ensure grid stability based on energy supply from renewables, or the fight against the corona pandemic when networked information on hospital bed capacities and predictions on incidence rates help improve health care for our population, for our citizens. And last but not least, the transformation of our economies where artificial intelligence um, is used to enhance industrial processes and that will save natural resources, CO2 emissions and energy. So early on, Baden-Württemberg recognized this huge value chain and promoted it. So forward-looking research is just as important to us as reaping tangible benefits now, we are proud to be home to Europe's largest AI research consortium, Cyber Valley. This is a global center of excellence for AI research of high renown, where academic and private sector partners are building bridges between curiosity-driven basic research and applied research. In the Cyber Valley Startup Network, 29 AI startups from the region demonstrate how to turn good ideas into innovative practice. So we wish to maintain and expand such a startup culture in science. We are building on these achievements. And in future, we will continue to undertake a lot of research and experimentation and invention in Baden-Württemberg, because this is our tradition. Investment in research and development is the highest in Baden-Württemberg, actually 5.8% of our gross domestic product. So AI will continue to be at the top of our agenda in the years to come because we realize that this is a highly competitive market in terms of innovation, but also in terms of attracting the brightest minds in the field. I'm therefore pleased that we are poised to expand the Cyber Valley AI Research Center by establishing an Alice Institute with the support of Hector Foundations. In mid-November, mind you, the Budget Commission earmarked another 15 million euros to launch a second AI innovation park. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to see that we are meeting today in an international setting, because international cooperation is crucial in this field. 
Being a global front runner will only be possible if we join forces at the European level. Going it alone in a key technology of this magnitude will get us nowhere. This is why we need internationally coordinated AI strategies and the expansion of international and transatlantic cooperation. Our democratic structures may become a great asset in this regard, and free and open discourse will serve our case. I'm fully convinced that together we can gain the necessary trust to fully exploit the potential of this new technology. So let's take another step in this direction today through the conference we hold. I look forward to engaging in our exchange and thank you very much for your attention. Humanity Empowered. This is the title of our conference today and tomorrow. And it is a particular pleasure welcoming this year's conference on artificial intelligence. Only until a very few days ago, we actually did not know if we are going to pull this off in a hybrid setting. We were thinking, should we do it all digitally? Should we all disinvite you? And then we said, no, we are going to try it and we are going to be brave and we are going to be resilient. So it fills me with a particular joy to see you here today in this room um, to discuss, to analyze, to learn from each other, um, and also to enjoy um, the personal and human contact which we have. I also want to um, welcome, however, also our digital participants because I know that it's not so easy today to really um, go to public events um, like this today. Um, uh, I do, under we all understand that, um, and I do have to say a lot of participants switched over last minute um, from being here to digitally, and we certainly very much understand. Um, and it is a pleasure to welcoming you as well um, today. This would not have been a, uh, possible without our strong partners. First of all, our co-organizer and host, the representation um, of the state of Baden-Württemberg to the federal government, Germany. Um, you have been a very strong partner over the last years. Um, and for me, this year started with a conference here on um, the inauguration of uh, Pre US President Obama, uh, sorry, Biden, <laughs> certainly Biden, um, and last year um, on the uh, election, election night. Um, and it's, it's just a really, really great pleasure um, being here today again. So thank you so much to you and to your team um, standing ready for all last minute changes which we, uh, which we had to do. Um, we also wouldn't be here today with another very strong partner, um, and that is the Heinz and Heide Dürr Stiftung, who have been, um, I would say, really um, from the beginning on in the thought process of our digital program and um, Rüdiger Lenz, who was until recently the director of the Aspen Institute and is also here today, um, will remember the first um, discussions you had um, with Mr. Dürr about digitalization um, and the artificial intelligence conference. And um, he has been also a very strong partner um, over the last years together with his team, so thank you so much. But this is not the end of the thank thanks, because we also wouldn't be here without our other partners and supporters. And there are um, Accenture, the Friedrich Naumann Stiftung, the Heinrich Böll Stiftung, Microsoft, and SAP, SAP. And um, many of you are here today. Um, so, so thank you so much uh, for supporting us and also for believing in us that we would really do this artificial intelligence conference. I want you to take a minute and remember. Remember where you are, were, remember what you thought, um, and the first thing I want you to remember is September 11th, 2001. The terror, attack, terror attacks on the United States. September 7, 
2008. The global financial system almost stood, or really pretty much stood, at the brink of collapse, and several US banks had to be rescued. March 11, 2020, the WHO Director General, General officially declared COVID-19 as a global pandemic. And only this summer, in July 2021, wildfires were ranging over the whole western parts of the United States, and we were hit by a devastating flood in Germany. So we are facing a multitude of risks and crises at the same time. The temperature of our planet is rising, wildfires, floods, droughts, storms, um, we are seeing them with in increasing um, frequency. We face uh, multiple refugee crises. Um, we see a lot of anti-democratic tendencies in a lot of countries and geopolitical conflicts. And whenever we are hit with crises like this, we are asking us, what could we have done better? Why didn't we not see this crisis coming? And if we saw it coming, why didn't we do anything about this? And most of all, why didn't we learn from these crises? And in other words, why are we not more resilient? Um, the G7, when they met this summer, um, vote to build back better um, and to increase and strengthen our common resilience. And what do we mean when we talk about resilience? We mean the ability to identify a crisis or a risk, so preparedness. We mean recoverability, the ability to quickly bounce back and recover from a crisis. We mean flexibility and adaptability, so the ability to adapt to, to, to the crisis. And foremost, we mean transformability, so the ability to transform our societies and make them less vulnerable, so to say, to leap forward after a crisis. And the G7 also said, and let me quote, um, if used properly, technologies can help us strengthen health capacities, tackle environmental threats, widen access to education, and open new economic opportunities. We will leverage these technologies to advance tech for the common good and promote digital literacy worldwide. I think we can all agree that artificial intelligence has a humongous potential to make us more resilient. Um, but it also poses a few risks we need to um, consider and we need to talk about. So on the individual level, for example, um, increased automation, digitalization can lead to job security. So how do we make our workforce fit for the 21st digital century? Uh, the implementation of digital technologies um, also encompasses new security risks. Uh, so how do we employ new technologies while ensuring cyber security? In some countries, artificial intelligence is not only used for good purposes. In some countries, it is used for mass surveillance um, and, for, um, and, and also um, neglecting human rights. So how do we um, make sure that dig digital technologies are really employed for the human good and not against us? And last but not least, digitalization can also increase global inequalities because not everybody has access, and we do also see some monopolistic or at least oligopolistic tendencies. So we want in the next day, um, day or two, we want to talk about the potentials and we want to talk about risks. Uh, we want to look at trade, health, climate, even space, um, and also our bureaucracy. And we want to do this nationally and internationally and we want to do this with you um, in a very interactive um, setting, I hope. So I'm looking forward to a lot of questions from, the, from you, the audience, um, but also from our digital um, audience. And we want to set the stage by um, getting a little bit more into the detail of artificial intelligence resilience. Um, and uh, we want to do this um, with an um, academic panel. 
And I would now like to ask our panelists and our moderator to come up here to the stage. This panel is going to be moderated by Kim Larson. He's principal, Bresla, Emery, and Ross. And not only this, he is a very good friend of Aspen Germany because he is the uh, president of Friends of Aspen Germany, Washington, DC. Thank you so much, Kim, for moderating um, today. And um, I'm looking at where our second panelist is. Um, I already warned, <laughs> warned the two of you that he might come in very, very late minute. As soon as he's here, we are going to send him up to the stage. Good. Good. Thank you so much. Just in here. Okay. Here. Okay, good. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Stormy. Ah, he's, um, he's already online. So oh. he made it, he, <laughs> he made it, and he is there online with us. <laughs> Very good. All right, thank you. Um, um, and, you know, we'd like to uh, welcome everyone to this panel. And let me say that, um, you know, as has been indicated, every crisis brings forth important lessons to be learned. And the current, you know, Global pandemic has revealed just how much room and necessity is, there is for, for these lessons. And the question is, what have we learned and how will that prepare us down the road the next 5, 10, 15 years? What lessons are to be drawn for this pandemic, for any pandemic, for the other issues we face? And, you know, while uh, resilience is not a new concept, it needs to be rethought. So let me introduce now, the, the members of, of our panel, uh, on my right, Professor Joanna Bryson, Professor of Ethics at the Heritage School. Uh, her research focuses on the impact of technology on human cooperation and uh, artificial intelligence, information and communication technology governance. And from 2002 to 19, she was on the computer science faculty at the University of Bath. She's also been affiliated with the Department of Psychology at Harvard, the Department of Anthropology at, at University of Oxford, the School of Social Sciences at the University of Mannheim, and Princeton Center for Information Technology. And I think we could, we could go on, but very, um, very good background, and, and I'm sure we'll look forward to what she says, and also Dr. Stefan Heumann, who um, is a member of the management board at the Stiftung Neue Verantwortung. Um, he's a political science by, scientist by training, and during the past years he's built uh, the Stiftung Neue Verantwortung into Germany's leading nonprofit, nonpartisan think tank, working at the intersection of technology and public policies. He's particularly interested in agile and collaborative methods of policy analysis, and he works, publishes, and speaks on a wide range of topics on German and international tech policy. He's also on the board of the Open Knowledge Foundation Germany. And um, so, so two very, very qualified and very good um, panelists here. And we want to um, start this with a, with a, a, a question which, which will ask for a short answer from both of our participants. Um, so what have you observed in the COVID-19 crisis pandemic that you know, how have people reacted to it? What steps have, have been taken? What does AI imply for this? How, what do you see? What lessons? Do you Joanna, let's start with you. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks. Uh, nice to be back in baden württemberg uh, And um, so I guess the main thing that we've all seen uh, with respect to technology and with respect to this particular uh, crisis, the crisis of, of the pandemic, is uh, this change in our understanding of freedom, um, the, 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 uh, the, the concerns, recognizing that we have to have an adjustable sense of when we can go out and what we can do. Um, ha the, all the countries trying to decide how much uh, to trust the information that we share in order to, to monitor things. So when I think about uh, what this particular crisis has told us, I think about um, uh, the security privacy trade-off, but it's not that simple. It's, it's much more about um, structuring your government 
such that you can handle a problem and communicate about the problem and then come back, you know, not just build back better, but, but re-expand immediately when the crisis is over, hopefully a little better then too, so you were doing good work during the crisis. Mm -hmm. I, I, I want to echo what uh, Stormy said when she introduced us, that there are four crises going on here, and I don't think that we can ignore or should ignore one of the main things I've observed in the last two years was a successful German election. A lot of us were afraid, now that Europe is recognized for its regulatory capacity, about the amount of money that was going to come into this election. And so I don't believe there was much sign of uh, successful interference in this election, and that's something to be celebrated. So I'm also thinking very much about democratic resilience and, of course, about sustainability. Uh, the, the, the crisis is not to be forgotten in winter. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Dr. Hoiman, same question for you. Yeah, hello. Um, very happy to join this um, panel. Um, I think um, on a, on a, from a broader perspective, it has shown us how interconnected and vulnerable we are. Um, I mean, we, we have a currently a trend of, um, you know, a, a resurgent nationalism and people want to build up borders again. And uh, COVID-19 really showed this is the, how, how interconnected we are um, and that it's no country in the world can, can escape the consequences and that we need to work together globally to find um, solutions. Um, so that's, um, that's the first thing. And I would say from a German perspective, and especially from a maybe technology perspective, um, the lockdowns have been particularly you know, formative experiences. And I think um, they have shown us how dependent we, have, we are on digital technology in, in a moment of crisis like this. And um, we have seen in Germany particularly how, how far we are behind other countries in terms of universal coverage with high-speed internet, on education system that does not only use digital tools, but I think only also poorly still prepares students for the digital transformation, and also a public sector that strug uh, struggles to digitize um, basic processes. And so I think um, this has been discussed a lot in kind of sort of policy circles and, and in the tech community, but we have had a broader public awakening around this, and, and now we have a new government and we'll see if, if this um, awakening and public uh, pressure will actually um, be uh, translated into real progress, even though there's some real challenges ahead for us to, to address these issues. Okay, thank you. So a, a big issue for, for this panel is how can we make our societies more resilient? Our societies are very complex, both technically, sociologically. Um, how can this resilience be supported and advanced with digital technologies? Joanna. Oh, I thought that was going to Stefan, wasn't it? I could, I could, okay, yeah. I'll try. Yeah, we'll go. Um, well, because uh, he's obviously attended a little bit more than I have to the uh, infrastructure questions. Thinking mm -hmm. at the meta level, I, I, the macroeconomic level, I actually think it's slightly terrifying how well we have done given how the, the incredible change that we saw in society and then we didn't see enormous drops in GDP. Mm -hmm. And that makes me wonder how GDP could be so disconnected from everyday lives of so many people. Mm -hmm. And I think this may be symptomatic of uh, inequality. Uh, so I, I think um, in a way, way we, can, we should and, and can celebrate the extent to which we were able to innovate despite all these, these problems. We were able to communicate in ways we can, including good solutions and spread them out. On the other hand, uh, I was speaking to some of my colleagues in the German government saying, well, at least now that you've had this experience, and this was like uh, almost a year ago, say, oh, at least now you've had this experience of, of dealing with a lockdown and everything, you're ready for the level of change we're gonna have to deal with with, with the sustainability crisis. And they all just paled. You know, they wanted to believe this was a one-off problem. Mm -hmm. But I, I really think that, uh, the, that like I said before, that what we need to be doing is, is creating all these capacities, but also defending against their abuse. And that the faster we can change, the easier, I mean, obviously Germany is one of the places you say, a, a government can come in that will take all the infrastructure and potentially use it for incredibly not what it was intended mm -hmm. for. Mm -hmm. And so we, we really need to be thinking both about 
being able to rapidly act and be resilient, and yet not being so resilient, or at least having some kind of defenses, such that the, this, this uh, capacity to interact isn't abused. Okay, thank you. And Dr. Hoyman, for you, what, how can we use our digital technologies to make our society more resilient? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great theme for the conference and, and a great question and something I've thought about. And I think it's, it's not primarily a technological question from what I'm seeing. I think that um, resilience at the moment um, is mostly about mindset and institutions. And because what we have seen, we actually do have great technology and, and great technological capabilities at our fingertips in, in Germany, but we have not really been using them to their potential. And so what do I mean, um, we need a mindset to become more resilient. I think we, we still lack more curiosity and excitement about technological change and its possibilities. And um, with this excitement um, comes an embracing of learning and collaboration. And I think that's something that the German bureaucracy has been um, particularly um, struggling with um, because it's very hier hierarchically and top-down organized. And I think learning on collaborative um, organizations um, are much more, much more open and, and also willing to take um, risks because you, you have to try out things because that's how you learn. And so you, I think our inability also to, to learn or to learn too slowly um, is linked to an unwillingness to take risks. And um, we focus on processes. We have a very legalistic culture rather than on outcomes. And so I think we have to, we have to get to a mindset where we are much more adaptable to changes and to challenges like COVID. After COVID, they will just be the next thing. And we are in the midst of a huge um, climate crisis that will um, require constant um, um, adaptation and trying out new ways and, and trying out new um, techno technical solutions and thinking how, you know, how they interact with society. There's no master plan for that, but um, therefore the mindset, the ability to adapt is really important. I think that's one reason why, why smaller countries have been more successful in shaping, I think, the digital transformation as well as in their responses to COVID because they often have this um, this mindset and the smaller countries are willing to, uh, to take more risks and try out things. And then we need to um, have the institutions um, that support that kind of mindset and um, that make help it uh, flourish. Um, institutions that um, need to invest in um, technical expertise and bring that together with um, sociological expertise and, and governing expertise, um, the breaking up of hierarchical silos um, more accountability, but not legalistic accountability, but accountability about um, out outcomes and incentives uh, for public servants to, to take risks and learn new skills. I think that's the basis from which we can use technology to address um, social challenges, whether it's a, it's a health crisis like the COVID-19 pandemic or climate um, um, change, which is an, an ongoing crisis and uh, something that will occupy our societies for the next decades. Thank you, thank you. Now, uh, this is for you, uh, Professor Bryson. AI is not only celebrated for its inspirational potential, but it's also the subject of numerous geopolitical and regulatory and certainly ethical conflicts. So what role can AI really play in making our society more resilient, and particularly with, you know, increased polarization and other issues. What What are your thoughts on that? Well, actually, that's great. I have a I had a couple of comments about it that come right back to that question, uh, based also on what Stefan just said. Um, First of all, uh, some people might be disappointed because we haven't really been talking about the robots very much. You know, there hasn't been a lot of uh, discussion about, well, we've got this new algorithm. Um, and I, I think it's because we are succeeding in making AI more pervasive. And so what, what the, the fundamentally what AI does is it makes us, well, there's two things. One is that it makes each of us faster, each of us better at doing our jobs. Um, which sometimes makes us more exchangeable, which comes into the future of work things, but we don't have time to talk about that too much right now. Um, I think it will come up later. Uh, but the, the other side of that is that um, 
We, well, actually, I want, I, 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 you mentioned polarization. One of the crises that we're facing is this crisis of inequality and polarization, and these are correlated with each other. A lot of people think uh, polarization is correlated with like social media use or something, and it's not. It is correlated with, with inequality, but not in every country. Germany and China are two interesting exceptions. Mm -hmm. And so we actually, I'll, I'll give you a few uh, uh, research things that have come out of Heritage School in the last year. Um, this, the first one is published already, which came out in December of last year, that, uh, that we showed that, the, that at least in, in theory, one of the reasons you might not be, uh, that you might suffer uh, polarization when you have high inequality, uh, sorry, when you have high, yeah, when you have high inequality is if there's people who are falling behind and getting near a precipice, then they can't take the risk of uh, working with someone they don't understand as well if that is higher risk, even if it has a higher expected payoff. So you just can't take the, lot, the risk of, uh, of um, a bankruptcy or a foreclosure or loss of custody of your children. So these kinds of things happen more often in contexts, well, inequality doesn't necessarily cause that kind of uh, slippage, but it does if the elite are allowed to take all, enough assets that the rest of the people are falling down. And Germany and China had worked hard to keep the bottom going up. Um, and so that's part of the reason we hadn't seen that. Well, we, uh, so there's two results I wanted to mention that came out this year, which are not yet published, but uh, one's from uh, my colleague, uh, Luciana Cangolosi, and she has shown that, um, that uh, in fact, the best compliance with uh, COVID restrictions happened in countries with high trust in their own governments. And whether it was democratic or autocratic didn't matter. It was just trust that mattered. And coming back to, to the stuff I was just telling you about, we went and looked at the data, because what I described before was a model. And we showed not only did we match up what we had predicted, but really, when you have that economic precarity, the main effect is this loss of trust. So not taking care of people, leaving them without enough of a safety net, and I don't think you, you, we've escaped it so long, but we may not be able to escape it forever if the inequality does increase. It's you know, like the housing crisis. If someone can buy an entire block and put one family in it, then a lot of other families have to move away. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think we do have to address these, and that's why we keep coming back and talking about the governance issues. I, just, I know I've taken a long term, but I just want to say finally about agility. Agility is, again, a luxury that you have to have enough capacity to do that. So we shouldn't just destroy the, the traditional infrastructure in order to be agile. We need to have good, um, appropriately refactored kinds of infrastructure that allow us to rapidly, as I mentioned before, uh, increase and decrease our security concerns and things like that. But too many people think agility in government is just throwing away and saving money infrastructure, and that, that's not true. And I have a paper on that, too. <laughs> <laughs> Email me if you need help <laughs> finding it, I mean. Okay, and, and uh, Dr. Hoyman, for you, um, um, how do you see, um, what should the government be doing to both proactively and in advance of, of destabilizing events, both identify them and take the necessary steps? And how can AI help with that or what, risks would itself, should, should, it, should AI itself, or should we view AI itself to bring to the situation? Yeah, um, I, it's interesting that we haven't talked that much about AI yet, mm -hmm. because I think um, in some ways, at least from a German perspective, we are still working on the basics, um, and AI sort of comes on top of it. And I actually see the biggest potential use cases at the moment for AI really in the in, in, in the research field, um, where we have lots of um, problem, uh, problems where um, big data sets and machine learning can, can help us. And we see in the healthcare sector, like certain questions we ask, we can automate and, and simulate um, and um, much quicker um, develop medicines or proteins and things. So there's, uh, there's some truly um, amazing potential there for AI. In terms of um, government, what is really interesting at this moment um, in Germany is that we are building data science capacities in our um, ministries and across government. You know, that's part of the data strategy that was adopted by the previous government, and I think the next government will, will take on and, and further develop. So we are, we are actually 
building the infrastructure for collecting more data and empirically better understanding um, how policy works and what effects it has. And I'm very excited about that um, potential. And I think um, AI can play a role in terms of um, you know, one method of analysis to see um, um, how policy works. What we've seen in the pandemic, though, and that, that is the part that makes me a little bit skeptic or pessimistic, is that um, we haven't really embraced that, that mindset yet. And it's truly um, frustrating um, often to see that, you know, how poor the quality of data still is we have on, on the pandemic, on where actually are the highest risks of getting infected. And I feel that's really still that we haven't really the, the basics in place um, in our um, public sector in terms of understanding the potential and then building up the infrastructure to, to have a good picture of what's going on and take much more measured, measured approaches and targeted approaches rather than having a national lockdown. And so I think there's, there's a lot of potential for us, um, but um, uh, in Germany we still have a way to go in terms of putting the basics in place to collect um, the data and put that into perspective to way, evaluate policy. And I think um, AI as a tool can play a role there if we are successful in, in building up these sort of data competencies um, across government. Okay. Uh, one element that, that you know, is critical for societies to be able to react quickly is that, that they have processes in place to both understand popular opinion to, to react to it. And the dem democratic institutions we have are extremely important, but also potentially exposed to AI mm -hmm. and can be influenced, on the other hand, by the AI that the government itself can have. How do you see that playing into the whole resilience issue? Yeah, no, I, I sort of alluded to that in my opening mm -hmm. uh, conversation. I think one of the biggest concerns has been Although I have to say, uh, to slightly correct you, mm -hmm. it's never artificial intelligence that does this. The digital, it's the digital re revolution and we use artificial intelligence, but the, somebody is, the, whole, the A in artificial intelligence is artifact. So let's talk about who are the actors that might be, for mm -hmm. example, choosing to, or not choosing to assault the German election or the American election or a Russian election, right? Who, who are the actors that, that would be motivated to do that? One of the really exciting things about the digital revolution is actually we've empowered everyone, and the same with the transportation uh, uh, mm -hmm. revolution. And that means that the great thing is that we have all this talent that's online that we can communicate with. The scary thing is that now we have massive amounts of migration, and anyone can kind of come in and have these kinds of influence. So uh, coming, coming back to the, the question about uh, democracy, again, what we have to do, and one of the things, people talk about uh, artificial intelligence, uh, the capacities, for example, of China, and, um, and say, oh, look, there's this huge thing, it's another model, it seems to be working, and yet nobody wants to go there, nobody wants to move there. So, so far, we have done better uh, the, people like to come to the EU, they like to go to America. We, we need to work, of course, economically to make people want to move all over so we can have exchanges and not have you know, too, too, much, too many people paying for too much stuff. But we also, uh, uh, yeah, we, we have to realize that we can identify, so this is what you can do with social media, you identify the types of people who are influenceable and you, you, identify, you make predictions about elections, say where are the close elections, and then you go and you try to influence them, maybe in person. It doesn't have to be hacking through social media, but you may actually go and set up rallies in the areas. It's about where you expend resources. And, and again, if you, have, uh, if you have too much stuff exposed in the digital media, we know the 2016 election, both political parties were hacked. The election itself wasn't hacked. But it could be that they, mis, they misallocated resources. For example, uh, Clinton's decision never to go to Wisconsin she was sure that she had the numbers, that her data science told her that Wisconsin was a sure thing. Why was she sure of that? So these are the kinds of, uh, uh, there's so many different uh, places that you can assault. And so I think one of the most interesting things, and I will say this, one of the questions we were asked before is what have we seen transnationally? The panels that I've been sitting on, there's a lot of dispute about should the EU be sort of recognized for, for what it's doing itself? Does it, it, does it have its own regulatory regime? And is it a third kind of thing besides China and America? Or is it essential that the US and China 
I'm not China, <laughs> the U.S. and the EU uh, somehow merge and, 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 and combine their regulatory uh, strategies. And it, it, especially the West Coast of the United States, of course, thinks that should just look exactly like the West Coast of the United States. Um, so not, even though they complain at the same time about their lack of capacity to legislate. Um, I think it's important that we should be empowering a lot of regions the way the EU has empowered itself, that when you have 400 million people, that's about the right amount. It, it makes it worthwhile for transnational companies to take you seriously. And so in my opinion, uh, it is important. Of course, when we have good solutions, we should, we should share them. And I'd like to see the EU, since we are so affluent, taking some of the resources that we have to invent, innovate legislation and, uh, and passing that out so we don't just say these are our rules and you have to use them, but we say these are our rules that work in these contexts and we have different rules even by nation. Here are other regions of the world who do not have as much legislative capacity. Here's like an entire suite of rules that you can use. Um, and that's supposedly what the Global Partnership for AI, which Germany is one of the uh, founding partners of, uh, is the, the kind of thing it's supposed to be doing. It's coming up with uh, regulatory measures, but not, re not normative recommendations, so, so that we can just, but being able to describe what are the options that governments that want to be like us might want to absorb so that they can more easily cooperate with us. Mm -hmm. But again, striking that balance, I think we, we, part of the reason Europe has proved resilient is because of the strengths of the nations within it, that we found a way to both have strengths as nations and to be harmonized and, and, and to, to use the economic. So I think it's a really interesting model, which is why I'm here. You can tell from my accent, I chose to come here twice. I took an EU passport in the UK. <laughs> and I'm very happy the new government says I might be able to get one uh, pretty soon in Germany too. So uh, who knows? Good. <laughs> um, so, you know, there are going to be a number of you, you both have seen the, um, you know, the agenda for the, for the remainder of the two days. Um, so let's start with you, Dr. Hoyman. What, uh, looking at the rest of the conference and, and the additional topics that are coming up, what observations or uh, comments do you have about, about those general topics? Yeah, what I would like to just um, make uh, one comment to what Joanna just said and, and the AI discussion. Mm -hmm. um, something that often gets overlooked is actually that the that the prevalence and use of AI um, sits at the heart of our question around democracy because um, it's uh, the social media and the big tech platforms that have been pioneering AI. And a lot of our online discourses if they have, as they have moved online are now shaped by um, machine learning recommender systems. And um, so one of, I think that AI is actually sitting at the heart of the question around democracy. Um, because um, how important AI is to how a TikTok or Facebook or Google works. Um, so I would just leave that as a, as a comment. Um, and um, regarding um, the conference, I mean, it's a, it's a very diverse um, um, program, um, really exciting. And um, what, I've, what I've seen, and I think what is also a theme here is that, and, and you've already mentioned it, is that a lot of people frame the discussion around AI as, the growing, as a growing conflict between the United States and China as sort of the AI superpower, superpowers that are competing sort of for, for technological dominance and the question how, how, you, how Europe fits into that or reacts to this. And I think what gets overlooked in this discussion is how internationally connected we are also in this AI space. Um, the research community is very international the collaboration is international. Um, a lot of the technology is very open. It's open source uh, technology that can be widely used. And uh, so um, we should uh, not leave sight um, of the interconnectedness. And I think you, know, you saw the, the ability of countries to pressure each other in the global supply chains is a result of that interconnectedness. Mm -hmm. But there's also I think, um, hope or um, something positive in that, because it is also a factor that continues to force us to talk to each other and to find um, global solutions. And I think that's an, an important theme, not just to talk about the conflicts and, 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 and the driving force to, to nationalize technologies, but actually how 
internationally interconnected we are and how much we have benefited from cross-border collaboration, especially in the field of AI. Thank you. Uh, Professor Bryson, same question. Uh, well, I, I have to totally agree. I, at the same time, I remember uh, my, my, my uh, master's students at Heritage School uh, saying, oh, but now countries matter again. You know, the countries are back. We thought they were nothing. You know, and countries will always matter for certain kinds of coordination because we have geographic problems. So there will always, always be nations. And at the same time, absolutely, what we're creating is something closer and closer to like Kant's perpetual peace, right? The, the level of interdependence. Although we also know we need redundancy. We don't want to have only one airplane company. We don't want to have only one GPS. Mm -hmm. We do need to, to do that for resilient supply chains. So going into the question, I mean, I, first of all, apologies. I'm going to be in and out a little more than I should be. I really apologize uh, for that. Uh, um, but anyway, I will be here most of the next two days, but not all. Um, but I'm very much uh, particularly interested in the cybersecurity and the trade uh, questions, um, partic and, and especially this, this issue about some things really are national, natural monopolies, and not in the old economic sense of, oh, it gets cheaper to make more episodes. It's more like everyone in the world could go and use the best one, so where, why would they go somewhere else? And if that's true, how do we uh, handle, how do we govern those things transnationally? We need to both get the revenue appropriately redistributed, which this 15% tax is just the beginning of, and why does that exclude, incidentally, finance and consultancies? I don't understand that. Um, but, the but the second, and this is you know, transnationalism in general, not only AI, but secondly, I, I still feel like we haven't adequately interrogated uh, and clarified how you can choose to exclude the president of an elected democracy from uh, social media. Now, it had a massive, we can measure and say there was a massive positive impact in the, in the reduction and spread of disinformation when that action was taken. So I do believe it's justifiable, but I do not believe it's been adequately justified. I think we need more clarity about when it's okay, because otherwise we, you know, everybody will just say, hey, I don't think there should be a, an opposing opposition party or whatever. So we really need to have more clarity about these kinds of uh, uh, actions. But anyway, I look forward to, there's so many panels here, I really look forward to almost all of them. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, thank you, I think that's all. Um, we're out of time, right? Okay. One more minute. Oh, okay. okay, good. So a, a critical issue on the on the issue of of sustainability and really resilience is: Do we plan for the best of times? Do we plan for the worst of times? Do you want things that will survive? Um, you know, or or things that maximize the current situation? What do you think about that, <laughs> Professor Bryson? Uh, well, I think that uh, the definition of uh, regulation actually is uh, trying to persist into the future. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think we are, it, th that's just sort of what life does. And it's the, it's the foundation of our ethics. You said I was a professor of ethics. I'm really a professor of ethics and technology, but I'll briefly sound <laughs> like a professor of ethics. I don't know another strong basis for ethics except to try to, you know, to, to perpetuate and, and, and optimize. But the question is what? What are we perpetuating out of all the things we are? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's really... Yeah, I, I, maybe I, we only have a minute, so maybe I'll just stop it very esoteric there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good. Then uh, we'll bring this to a close. Um, okay. Good, right. thank you. Thanks. Thank, thank you very you much so. to our panelists. Thank yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so very, very thank much you. to a very rich uh, panel. We are going to do a very, very short break of just a few minutes, maximum five minutes. So we uh, have a new, little bit of a new setup up here. And then we are going to continue with a really exciting panel on global supply chains, resilience and artificial intelligence with a, I would say, super round of panelists. So if you need to quickly step out, get yourself a drink, um, please do so, but be back quickly as well. And please reseat yourself where you were sitting. This is important to us because of COVID and hygiene um, standards. So, and please wear your mask when you're walking around. So see you in just a couple of minutes.
Um, I already warned you, this is going to be a very short break um, only, because um, we are looking um, forward to a very, very exciting um, panel um, with six really, really esteemed uh, panelists. Um, and it is a pleasure seeing um, a lot of old friends um, here um, online, and I very much wish um, that you would have been able to be here and that we would have been able to celebrate the, uh, the topic of AI um, and resilience personally, but these are the times we are, we are currently facing. So I thank you for making the time at all, because I know how awfully busy you are um, in trying to build the resilience which you need and uh, taking a close look at uh, global value chains. So let me um, quickly introduce um, our panelists. Um, with us today is Dan Mulaney. He is Assistant uh, U.S. Trade Representative for Europe and the Middle East um, in the office of the U.S. Uh, United States Trade Representative. Then it is such a pleasure seeing you again. Um, thank you so much for making, making the time. Um, also here with us is uh, Martin Barkman. Um, he's Senior Vice President and Global Head of Solution Management and Digital Supply Chains from SAP. And um, also one of the supporters um, of our conference today um, and working from a practical point of view um, on resilience and supply chain issues. So thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, today. Um, also with us today um, is Marion Janssen. Um, we've also known each other for a long time. Um, she is now uh, Director um, of the Trade and Agriculture Directorate at uh, the OECD. And um, I really wish you could have made it um, over here, but um, that's, that's what we have to deal with um, today. Short-term decisions um, also by the organizations we uh, work for. Um, allowing us to travel or not allowing us to travel. But thank you so much uh, for joining us um, online. And also with us today is uh, Denise Redoné. He is Deputy Director General, European Commission. Um, thank you so much um, for joining us today. I'm very much looking forward um, to your insights. Um, Hazard's thank you. Um, it's so nice seeing you again after we had just, um, I have to, sw I mean, I have to look at the camera, but I'm seeing you here. This is why I'm looking up and down. Um, so it's really nice seeing you to today again after we had just seen each other a month ago um, in Italy, where we talked about um, NATO and resilience and what, what NATO could and should do about resilience. So I'm very happy that you are here today. And Sandra Weser, um, thank you so much for also making it today. You will bring in the German voice um, in this very, very international panel. And um, I know with the um, new government just f forming these days and the new coalition and saying goodbye to our chancellor tomorrow and everything that is going on politically, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we really, uh, really appreciate that you made the time. I do not want to um, start with a lengthy description of what we are going to talk about. Um, we all know a lot happened in supply chains and artificial intelligence plays a very big role in it. And we also know um, that the crisis showed us that we are really quite vulnerable. Um, but we also came through the crisis not so badly with regard to supply chains. So we bounced back pretty fast as well. So what we want to, this is, this is the theme we want to discuss. Um, and what I would like to ask all of our panelists um, for the beginning, um, a brief question with just a brief answer of all of you, uh, from all of you, is what you are currently um, observing, ob uh, observing in global supply chains. How are they and have they changed um, because of the crisis and where are our vulnerabilities? Um, and I would like to start um, with uh, Marion, you, um, could you, because you, I mean, the OECD is a data cracker. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about what you're observing. Uh, thank you, Stormy, and very pleased to be here, albeit only digitally today. Uh, we were asked to prepare three points, three main aspects of uh, the value chains as they've developed during the pandemic. And I would like to make the following three points. First, we have found that at the beginning of the pandemic, global value chains 
performed well and resisted very well. Actually, thanks to global value chains, we could deal with a lot of problems at the beginning of the crisis. Second point, in the second year of the crisis, 2021, that's where we have been seeing serious supply chain disruptions, and we are still in the middle of that. And third, when we listen to discourses from different parts of the public, we find that there is quite a difference between the policy discourse, some often referring now to the terms like decoupling, and the private sector that uses the core words a lot, more coherence, more collaboration, cooperation, and um, more better communication. Coming back to the first point, what we have seen at the beginning of the crisis was a huge demand shock increased demand for things like masks, um, disinfectants, and other sanitary products. At the global level, supply chains reacted rapidly to that. This We saw, for instance, a tenfold increase of exports of masks within one month of time. Yet, we have seen problems in individual countries, including in Germany, but that was due, in our, according to our anal analysis, to big surges in demand. No single country would have been able in the combined shock that we saw to respond to all of this at the same time. Supply chains reacted quickly. The second problem, supply chains being in trouble now, is according to our analysis due to an unfortunate combination of at least three things. First, uh, we have seen production picking up again at different speed in different places of the world. China went out of confinement earlier than, for instance, Europe or United States. So China is exporting with containers going from Asia to the West, with containers cannot be filled to go back into the other direction. Second, demand has shifted. For instance, huge increases in demand for electronics because of teleworking, because of more entertainment at home. And that also changes what has to be transported from one place to the other. And third, big problem still on the services side. Services trade is not back to where it was. We, however, see that in China, services exports are beyond where they were before the crisis, mainly due to increases in transport services, various in the West, where tourism services play an important role. Services exports continue to be down. So um, three phenomena that explain this problem that we are currently seeing. The private sector is asking us for, to help them uh, to, in, to, in, to install better communication and cooperation between public and private sector, and also encourages governments to make more coherent policies and to collaborate more in order for things to more easily cross borders. I will leave it here, and I look forward to listen to the rest of the discussion. Great, thank you so much uh, for starting us off, giving us a very good overview. And you also mentioned already the, um, the private sector. So Martin, let me uh, turn to you and ask you from a um, business perspective, what is, uh, what is changing in global value chains? And maybe you can also already bring in the perspective on um, what can AI um, do to help us maybe to address our vulnerabilities? Yeah, absolutely. and and. I think Marion said, said it really well in terms of what, what's happened. What we're seeing is the emergence of three dimensions of, of what's important for supply chains, right? So we've seen that it's important for supply chains to be resilient, customer-centric, and sustainable, right? So resilient means the supply chain is able to absorb shocks and bounce back either to where it was or to a better place. That is now very much a focus topic. At the same time, supply chains have to be customer centric. Demand, demand patterns have shifted. The mix of products that customers and organizations and governments are ordering or demanding is different. And sustainability has now even more come to the forefront. It's not just about meeting the overall goals around sustainability, but supply chains that rely upon scarce raw materials or single threaded are unable to operate in a sustainable way. And I think it's fair to say, if a company aspires to be sustainable, their supply chain has to be operating in a more sustainable way. What's interesting is what are the common themes around um, what has allowed companies to fare better and attain those three dimensions. And, and the one common theme that we see 
is this notion of digitalization. And I'm not talking about just a conversion of analog data into digital form, but rather leveraging vast amounts of information that is now available and changing the way that decisions are made so that you can make decisions faster and better and in a, in, a, in a fundamentally different way. And that I think is where terms like artificial intelligence, machine learning is really the backbone of what's powering that type of digitalization, which, which I'm sure we'll talk more about here as the panel, as, as we continue our discussion. Well, thank you so much. And we definitely come back to um, uh, the, the issue of um, utilizing huge amounts of data to identify vulnerabilities, but also to, re to react to them maybe in real time. And sometimes I find it hard to wrap my mind around it, how it really works. Um, and um, I'm sure you can explain that to us um, in the sec second, second round. Um, let me uh, now turn to uh, Denise. Um, how are, um, the same question to you, um, for the European Union, um, how um, have our value chains been hit by the crisis? What are you observing and how can technologies help us? Uh, sure, thanks very much, Tommy. Very great to be with, with you on, on, on this panel. Um, look, I think from our perspective, of course, uh, my, my, my perspective is more of a policy perspective. I, I think we, we very much agree, I very much agree with what Marion was, was saying. I mean, our first uh, uh, major takeaway from what has been happening uh, over the last few years from a, from a government perspective is that we have to be clear that the, the, the pandemic, the crisis that ensued, was not in and of itself a crisis of global value chains or of international economic uh, integration. Uh, most value chains have shown resilience. They are acting uh, not just as a... Uh, as a contributor to economic efficiency, but as shock absorbers as well, uh, and will contribute to repair uh, uh, and avoid disorganization uh, in order to contribute to the recovery. Um, of course, that requires that supply chains are adequately resilient, which in our understanding of the term would mean, and I think I would agree with what Martin was saying, both diversified sufficiently and adequately diversified, but also sustainable. And sustainability is therefore becoming also in our policies, including in our trade policies, an important component. Point number one. Point number two, I think we're very clear that we are seeing, we're experiencing in the EU across the 27 member states, disruption and disorganizations now that uh, uh, Marianne was talking about. And we need to separate, I think, clearly the diagnostic between what's happening in the short term, what's happening on a more structural basis. Now, on the, in terms of getting a proper assessment of vulnerabilities uh, and capabilities in some of our major industrial ecosystems in Europe, we have, out of the public authorities, out of the EU institutions, tried to do a proper fact-based, evidence-based mapping of, of this. We did this in the spring uh, when the European Commission uh, uh, brought forward an update of the EU industrial strategy. And there, basically, the findings are, are, are fairly clear. If we look at a, a universe of products that corresponds to these most sensitive or critical ecosystems, the number, the sheer number of products and the volume of trade and imports that these products represent that are genuinely vulnerable in the sense of products that suffer from a very high import dependency and concentration. And products where diversification or the development of domestic capacity may not be easy to achieve are actually a very limited subset of these industrial ecosystems, mostly in terms of critical raw materials and mostly in the health sector. So it's not a, a wholesale problem of vulnerability. It's a targeted question of vulnerability that their public authorities have to have policies to, to address and not on their own. We believe very much that this issue of supply chain resilience is an issue that should be the subject of discussions and engagement with partners, including the most like-minded partners of the European Union. That is, for example, the case of the United States. That's why we're very happy that under the newly established Trade and Technology Council, and perhaps Dan will, will, will talk about this, we have strands of work and discussions on these issues, on our respective dependencies, on our common dependencies 
for example, vis-à-vis -vis China. Uh, and, and these are these are dialogues that we think we must nurture in order to contribute to the question of resilience. Final point, there it's a little bit more um, uh, negative or worrying from our point of view. We also think that to some extent the the tensions that we've seen over the last few years have highlighted more structural systemic tensions uh, beyond this temporary disorganization of supply chains and tensions in the trading system. And that tensions are many for one is there is a, a, a certain spillover of geopolitical tensions in the world of trade and investment. And that uh, is linked in part to uh, rivalries. I'm thinking about the US-China relationship, but that affects us in Europe as well. And we've got to be mindful of this uh, going forward. We've also seen that there are underlying structural and systemic distortions uh, in the trading system that predated the crisis, that are still there and will continue to be there and need to be addressed. I'm thinking about a range of non-market distortions coming from non-market policies and practices, uh, uh, which we have to find ways of addressing. And this is why there again engagement and cooperation matters. The relaunch of the trilateral process on trade between the US, the EU and Japan this week is one of the avenues for, for, for dealing with this. And we are concerned finally because this is happening in an environment where we have a, a weakened rules-based trading system with the WTO at its center. And in our view, part of what public authorities, governments need to do on the policy side is to ensure that we move and are capable of having more global trade rules, that we work on WTO reform in order to ensure first and foremost predictability in international economic relations, which at the end of the day is what undermines also stable and resilient uh, uh, global supply chains. I think I'll leave it with, with, with that, introducing perhaps those, those more uh, uh, policy aspects uh, into the discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. This is this is a lot of food of food for thought um, and almost a ten point plan um, how to increase our trade resilience. And I'm glad that you um, pointed at the nexus between trade and investment. And later on today, we are also going to have the pleasure of welcoming um, uh, Rebecca Greenspan um, from the from the UNCTAD. Um, with whom we are also going to talk about this, this nexus. Um, let me now, because you already mentioned it, Denise, um, the TTC and the transatlantic relationship, I mean, so central to making us more, making us more resilient. Um, so I hand over to Dan um, for your thoughts. Great, well, thanks, thanks very much, uh, Stormy. Really, really great to be here. Thanks for the, uh, thanks for the invitation. Yeah, in the transatlantic space, we've been we've been very very busy over the last nine months. We've removed some significant trade irritants um, with respect to the WTO case on, on, on aircraft. Of course, the uh, uh, discussions on steel and aluminum and uh, sort of the the, the, the threatened uh, trade irritants as a result of the digital services uh, tax. Um, and in in several of those instances, including in uh, with respect to uh, to the uh, 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 aircraft sector and uh, steel and aluminum, uh, we've started a, a, a process of uh, determining how we can work together to face common challenges that we face, uh, not only with respect to non-market economy policies and practices, which uh, Denis mentioned, uh, but also with respect to, um, to, to climate-related re uh, resilience. Um, you're right to, to point out that we the other thing that we've, we've done um, over the past uh, uh, six months is to set up this US-EU Trade and Technology uh, Council and to have its first inaugural meeting in September. And that is, among other things, aimed at building a, a strong and resilient transatlantic market, especially with respect to high-tech and, and emerging products, a, a market that is uh, as free as we can make it from unnecessary barriers to trade be between us. Um, and also, and, and very importantly, uh, a market that, that reflects our, our values, which is very much, I think, related to the kind of resilience that you're, you're talking about, uh, which includes values of rule of law, uh, transparency, market-oriented conditions, um, and also a protection, a protection of, of labor, um, labor rights. But not, not only, um, I mean, we're not only seeking to, to reinforce this transatlantic marketplace based on, on our values, 
Uh, but we are looking to work together to, to project those values globally and to collaborate very closely on some of the challenges that, that we in the United States face and, and I, I think the, uh, uh, the, the EU considers that it faces as well with respect to some of the effects of non-market economy and, and uh, practices and, and policies uh, in the global environment. Because these are policies that can very much affect uh, our resilience, uh, can very much affect um, the, the values that we want to pre project when it comes to uh, issues like artificial intelligence and other topics that you're going to be discussing uh, during this during this panel. Um, I think it's a, it's going to be a, a, a extremely important, and I think we're on a good path. Uh, for us to work very closely with our, our European allies to build this transatlantic space, to, to focus on, uh, on resilience in a market that reflects our, our values, um, and also work together to, 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 to ensure that those values are, are projected internationally. And I think we're, as I, I mentioned, I think we're off, to, uh, we're off to a good start so far over the last, uh, over the last nine months. Um, then, if I may ask a follow-up follow question, you have seen, I mean, you have seen up and downs in the transatlantic relationship. Um, you have worked on TTIP, um, then you have not worked on TTIP um, during a period where it was a little bit more tricky, um, and now there seems to be a lot of positive dynamic again. Within the TTC, are you talking about artificial intelligence and to jointly, how to jointly regulate um, new technologies like AI together? I think, I mean, there are going to be a, a, a range of, of, of topics uh, in the TTC. Uh, it, it, it will focus clearly on, on the regulatory in, uh, environment and how we address our, the regulatory challenges together. Uh, I mean, the question of, of, of joint regulation is, um, is uh, jumping quite, quite far ahead. I think what we, can, what we can do now in the meantime is, is to make sure that whatever um, whatever regulations or standards or, or guidelines are put forth in these areas of, of key emerging technology, uh, make sure that they are, they are done in, in a way that does not unnecessarily impinge on the free flow of goods and services between uh, the US and, and the EU, and also make sure that they, that, that they, um, uh, that they push back against uh, certain values that others have that we, that we don't share. Um, so I think very much in terms of making sure that we don't uh, introduce uh, uh, friction, unnecessary friction in the, in the US-EU relationship across the board in all emerging technologies, including AI and, and, uh, and everything else, I think that will be, that will be very much a, a, a key focus. And as I say, it's sort of dual facing. We're focused very much on the bilateral relationship uh, between the United States and the EU when it comes to these, uh, these uh, regulations and standards, but also the issues that we, uh, that we, uh, that we pursue globally as we pursue our, 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 our joint global challenges. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much um, for these insights. Let me now turn to Sandra. Um, we, as I mean, the German economy is extremely trade uh, dependent. Trade to GDP, uh, exports, imports, goods and services is uh, more than 80%. Um, so we were hit hard by the last couple of big um, economic crises which we faced. Um, uh, and, um, well, we benefit a lot from good times uh, when trade is doing well. Um, you have been uh, following trade issues for a very, very long time um, and for your party, I'm sure, also brought in some good ideas for the coalition uh, uh, agreement, for the coalition contract. Tell us a little bit about the German position on global value chains um, and also certainly on technology and AI. Yeah, thank you, Stormy, and thanks for being here today. And uh, of course, the, I think the Liberal Party was always a, a very big friend from uh, free trade agreements and, and trade in general. And um, I am really proud that uh, one of my initiatives that I made uh, a couple of months ago in the German Parliament, which was labeled a transatlantic economic area, became part of the coalition treaty. 
And uh, that means that we have to, 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 let's say, find friends in, uh, in a common sense of having the same values, sharing uh, the same values and going for, let's say, a transatlantic um, coalition. But the transatlantic means also, let's say, partners as Australia, um, New Zealand and so on. But I just want to want step once again to your first question, because um, there are a lot of, of very interesting things already said, but I have also made a very personal experience here in Germany. In, for a couple of months ago, we had uh, in my home state, Rhein, Rhineland uh, Palatina, a huge flood in one area where really uh, uh, the whole region more or less is destroyed and also is infrastructure. And um, the government made up a, a fund with uh, 30 billion euros to, to help the people immediately. There were a lot of um, help uh, also from the private sector. But at the end, what we had to learn is that it's not always a question of money to, to come out of these problems. What I understood from a political side is that... Uh, we cannot solve everything with money, but we need to understand that the people, the infrastructure and the production cap cap capacity, sorry, <laughs> which ultimately determine that we can build and consume. And so we really have to, to get our supply chains more resilient, also focus on these kind of points. Let's say, how can we get the people working in, in Germany? How can we make, uh, for, for example, immigration uh, law that helps also to find all the craftsmen, all the, the people who can build something, who can install. For example, in this region, what I learned that we are not able to install uh, heating systems because we don't have the people to install them. It's not all, also a question of the, the, the heating system. It's a big question of the people to do this. And this we also have, uh, let's say, to focus when we are talking about um, supply chains. But also, I think Germany has to, to, to diversify, to find, as I said, a lot of, of, of countries which we can work together with the same values, but also not to keep the balance too high for, for the treaties. I have a little bit um, the fear that when we are asking too much from our partners, that we will not be able to find a common space to, to come quickly together. We really maybe have to get a small barrier and then come to, a, to, to agreement. And then after this, set up the next step. And after this, the next step, like the European Union, it was not built as the European Union we know today. It started with a common uh, market on coal and um, Therefore, I'm really a, a friend, a pragmatic friend uh, to say, let's do it really now, but step by step and maybe not aiming too high. Well, thank you so much. Um, and also for bringing us back um, and remembering uh, or reminding us um, how important resilient is, resilience is uh, for our everyday lives, really, um, by pointing, pointing at the floods. Um, has it um, now the Na at NATO? Um, you, you are used to um, doing crisis preparedness exercises. Um, you are used to um, uh, doing uh, scenario exercises. Um, more in the security area, I understand. Um, now we are talking about resilience in a much, much, much broader context. Um, so how come? That the NATO that NATO is is actually thinking about resilience in a, in a very very new kind of um, environment and kind of setting um, and also to pick up again my first question what are you what have you actually actually been observing with regard to value chains over the last month? Well, that, thanks a lot, Stormy. Uh, really good to be here. I. So say, I wish I was in Berlin right now, given how rainy it is in Brussels. Maybe there's a chance that it's not as rainy in, in Berlin. Uh, but it's great to be here. I really benefited from hearing all of my colleagues on the panel with their different perspectives. Um, I'll bring a defense and security perspective to this discussion, um, which I think is, is an interesting angle at this question of supply chains 
Um, and to, to, to start with your first question, you know, how did NATO, you know, come to, to look at resilience? I think NATO has been thinking about civil preparedness and civil emergency planning for quite some time. Uh, this is a function that goes back to the 1950s, uh, and civil emergency planning was a key part of our preparedness during the Cold War. Uh, you know, I think many um, uh, people in the audience that with memories will remember, uh, you know, the, the, the German civil defense and how it was linked to NATO's defense preparations during that period. But certainly, you know, in the last, you know, six years, there's been kind of a reawakening and a, and a reframing of, of resilience at NATO uh, which is related to, to the ability uh, of our societies to defend themselves. And, and the SecGen said it before the summit, he said, you can't have strong militaries without a strong society that underpins them. Uh, and I think that um, this changing security environment, certainly since 2014, um, ha has really brought this into light. And we keep learning lessons that you know, we thought we had learned, but uh, clearly some of them have been forgotten. But also this is new ground in, in a lot of ways. And this is where it kind of connects to the AI discussion, which I think is really interesting. And I'm, I'm taking notes as we, as we go on, on some of the, uh, the colleagues' views on, on these uh, aspects. Really, this is about, fundamentally, it's about um, the things that allow the allies and the alliance itself to defend itself. And those are those critical uh, components, materials, um, supplies, and, and other vital elements without which you know, we couldn't get off the ground or we couldn't get off the start line. Um, I think that there's three kind of things that we have observed, um, you know, over the last little while, certainly my team uh, here working on resilience. You know, when, when this um, first started, I remember a little, little uh, vignette. I remember, you know, my, my colleague who works on joint health, disruptive health crises as a part of our resilience work. And he came and he showed me this WHO report from Wuhan and said, you know, something is weird here. Something isn't right. Um, and I remember running this up the flagpole and getting people to say, hey, this is just some faraway thing. You know, two weeks later, we're in lockdown and everybody wants to know what is this COVID thing and, and what does it mean? Uh, and so, you know, those of us who work in this area have been really, you know, as they say, don't let a good crisis go to waste. And we certainly haven't done that. You know, we think we've been actively looking at, at what we could learn from this. And there's three things I think, you know, that, that I want to talk about. One is the security implications of all of this and the importance of assured access, preparedness and planning um, for nations and for NATO as we look at some of these vulnerabilities. And here, uh, emerging disruptive technologies like AI are increasing risks and opportunities in this space. Uh, and so I think we need to be alive to some of those issues. Secondly, how the military and our armed forces are dependent on the civil and commercial sector. Uh, and it was harder before COVID to make this argument because people would say, well, you know, I think everything is okay, but COVID has been a generational disruption. Uh, and even our military colleagues are going, this could happen in other areas too. So we need to be, we, we need to be alive to that. Um, and, and I think also this, this importance of, you know, this, I think some others, other colleagues have talked about it, kind of a sensitive political conversation, especially for NATO, because we don't, um, you know, this is not our lane, I guess I could say, but this concern about dependence on foreign supply chains and, 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 and foreign actors, and also the interdependencies, and this is something I want to pick up, um, the interdependencies between these sectors and how a cascade effect can be seen. And we saw that in some way in COVID-19, but this concern about interdependencies and cascading effects is something that uh, that's certainly on our mind. And as we look to consider, you know, measures to protecting supply chains or building supply chain resilience, you know, it, it does come back to, you know, doing the peacetime preparedness uh, and planning work uh, that, you know, never goes to waste as we keep telling people uh, you know, a dollar spent on preparedness is not a dollar that goes to waste, especially in the in the security environment that we're in. So I'll leave it at that. I'm interested in the discussion a lot. Thanks again for giving me the floor. Yeah, thanks so much uh, for sharing your time with us. Um, let me come back uh, to to uh, Martin. Um, what we just heard from Hazid is that we are at least in some technology, some product, pretty dependent on um, individual suppliers. Um, so, and, and we know this. Um, 
in, in how far can technology really help us to, like AI, help us to identify vulnerabilities? Don't we know these vulnerabilities? Um, is it really an issue of um, technology or is it more an issue of, of mindset um, and, and costs? Um, yeah. Yeah, please. No, it's a fair point. And in, in, in some ways, it's, it's a combination of both. I mean, look, I think supply chains historically were designed and set up for the most part to minimize cost. And that often meant you constantly pursue the lowest cost sources and you work with the lowest cost inputs into the supply chain. And that created in many cases, very, very interconnected global supply chains. Now they are not gonna go away, but what's happening now and as we've heard is we're no longer only gonna solve just for cost. We're gonna solve for resilience customer centricity and of course sustainability. And that might lead to the emergence of supply chains that in some cases are regional, uh, in some cases are located very, very close to what I'll call the customer or the point of demand. And to do that effectively while still doing it in a cost-effective manner, emerging technologies around digitalization will come into play. I, I wanna comment a little bit on artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, because on the one hand, these things can seem like buzzwords and what do they really mean? What are they fundamentally? Historically, right, when perhaps we went to school, uh, we learned that one way to, to model something is to develop kind of like a rough mathematical model or a theory or an equation that roughly predicts what happens in the real world. And you spend a lot of time trying to tweak that model so that it can explain the data. In some ways, machine learning flips that around where we just look at the data and we're not married to the model. We let the patterns in the data describe and tell us what has happened, what is happening, what will happen, and perhaps even what should happen. So I almost equate it to the way, you know, physicists that came in the late 1800s, early 1900s, they looked at data and said, wait a second, what Newton is saying in his theory isn't necessarily applied, it isn't necessarily correct. So they said, well, gosh, my data must be wrong. And then a few physicists came along and said, you know what, I think my data is right. Perhaps the model is wrong. And then of course, a whole new branch of physics uh, emerged as a result, and, and we're all familiar with that. And I think machine learning is a way to start looking at business problems in, in a very, very different way, and then applying that to the way decisions are made. So that, so, so to answer your question, do we have this understanding today? Maybe, the answer often lies in the data, but can it be, be, be rendered to the point where the decisions are made in a way that people can take, take action. So whether you're trying to diversify your suppliers or whether you are trying to better match supply and demand, whether you're trying to understand if something that you're seeing is an outlier effect or something genuinely real, this is where these digital technologies can come into play so that we understand and can model and really frame the supply chain. Ultimately, what we see, what I'll, I'll conclude with is you end up with this digital twin of the real world, right? So you have the real world physical supply chain, you have a digital twin that is showing you what is actually happening. And in some cases, I say twin because you can even control the supply chain in the physical world by manipulating the parameters in this digital twin. So it's like a bi-directional flow of information between this, this digital rendering and the physical supply chain. So there's just a huge area of opportunity that we see uh, supply chains capitalizing on and, and doing it in many cases quite successfully. Mm. When I talked to economists um, in the beginning um, of this crisis, many told me, um, oh gee, our models don't work um, and we don't have models um, for what we are currently facing. And there was a lot of adapting um, to, uh, to the crisis and a lot of learning. Um, I said earlier on that I want to make this panel interactive and also bring in um, the audience, um, not just for Q&As, but also for, for a discussion. Now I'm looking, is Joanna still with us? 
Um, no, otherwise I would have uh, brought, brought her in um, for um, talking a little bit about um, also the uh, ethics uh, side. Um, do you have any questions um, in the audience, comments? And don't be shy. I know that it's always a little bit difficult um, when everybody is online. No. Okay, no problem. Um, then I bring in a couple of questions um, which have already um, been sent uh, to us digitally. Um, and also on, on the issue um, of, of modeling and how to use data um, and if that if, if those models and the data really work. Um, and uh, for this, I want to hand over again to uh, Marion, um, because I'm sure that you also had to adapt your models uh, you are working with. What, what was your experience? Yes, Tommy, I feel that you would direct that, uh, that question to me. Indeed, um, the modeling world um, has been uh, also under strain, just like supply chains, uh, but already for quite some time, I would say. We are used in trade. Uh, we like to work with two types of models, uh, so-called general equilibrium models, without knowing how they function. I think the term general equilibrium already suggests that it doesn't fit for the kind of crisis and disruption mode that we are currently in. So uh, not necessarily the best fit to assess what is going on. Second, we use econometric type of models where we use past data. Um, and also that is not the best way of dealing with um, situations where we have many and very frequent changes. So yes, we are looking at using different types of data, more real-time data. We are using at different types of models uh, to make sure that we can fill data gaps and to make sure that we can look more into the short-term future and can deal with multiple and frequent changes in our predictions. Um, we, will have, we have to push economists sometimes out of their comfort zone uh, for this. Uh, and I will um, also admit that we use different types of models, different types of expertise increasingly to do our economic uh, modeling. Uh, one of the big changes uh, that we observe when it comes to data is that there is in the past we were as economists, and I'm speaking about 20, 10 years ago, mainly dealing with data available in the public sphere. The big owners of big data uh, are currently private sector players. And this puts sometimes um, national governments and, um, and also international organizations like ours to uh, at a disadvantage. We have, of course, strengthened our collaboration with private sector, uh, with the private sector also when it comes to data. But my experience is that the private sector is as careful releasing data mm. as governments may have been in the past. I would be very interested to hear Hazit's point of view and experience with this matter. So a lot going on there. Interestingly, and here I will close with this, when we recently organized a workshop, a conference on stress tests in supply chains with speakers from major global supply chains, interestingly, the issue of transparency and access to data came up very prominently with the private sector asking for more information from the from governments and governments asking for more information from the private sector so there's definitely more to be done to increase transparency and to make us all jointly better in reacting to crisis preempting and being resilient um, Martin, keep that in mind. We come back to you in a second um, uh, and ask you a little bit about the data um, and access to the data and transparency and, and sharing that data with governments and also maybe sharing that data with governments in third countries. But I do have already um, more questions um, I want to pose. And the next one goes to Denise and, uh, and Dan. And it is a question about the geopolitical conflicts we are now seeing in the trade and investment world. And um, one of our participants is asking, so um, what about them? Um, how can we get out of them? And is technology something which could actually help? Or is it something which is going to intensify our, uh, the conflicts we are currently seeing? Dan, would you like to start? And then Denise. Yeah, sure. I, I, think, um, um, I think the, uh, the, 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 the newer technologies and uh, the, the, emerging, the emerging technologies, I think they offer a, an opportunity for, um, especially you know, for the United States and, and the European Union uh, to come together 
to, uh, to, to a large extent and, uh, and agree on, um, agree on, on, on certain commonalities with respect to the, the technologies and regulation of those technologies. And I think also provides a, 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 a model for bringing more uh, international partners on, on board with, um, with some of the values that, that, that we share. So I think I do see um, you know, the emergence of these, the, the, the new technologies and especially the um, increased focus between the United States and the European Union on, on addressing those technologies. Uh, I see that as, as an opportunity to, to, to perhaps uh, reduce some of, the, uh, some of the geopolitical tensions uh, uh, around the world. I mean, I think we both, I, I think, uh, understand that our particular values, and I did, I, I you know, listed some of those off, transparency, uh, rule of law, uh, market-oriented conditions. I think uh, many of those values are, are those that can that can serve everybody well globally, and to the extent that we're able to work together on those in the context of new and emerging technologies, I think there's an opportunity for for uh, for reducing some of the tensions that are out there. Thank you so much. Um, over to Denise. I, I think I'd add to to what Dan just said. Maybe the the, the following two two things. One is in order to deal with the, the, the tensions and the possible spillover of geopolitics into geoeconomics or international economic relations, well, it's going to be very important to try to shore up the existing frameworks and institutions that enable that conversation to remain rules based. So, for us in Europe, shoring up those institutions, ensuring the return to the primacy of international economic law matters. Because again, it does provide at least a zone where everybody stays under one tent and is able to have a civilized conversation. So that is a first order uh, priority uh, from our point of view, because I think governments have a responsibility to avoid unnecessary um, deintegration of the global economy or fragmentation of the global economy. There's a large planks of the global economy which should remain uh, increasingly integrated globally because it makes sense to do that. Uh, on the other hand, I think there's there's a challenge on the policy side, which is to try to devise the, the right instruments and the right international cooperation to deal with a zone where trade and investment meets tech and security uh, issues. And that zone exists. That zone actually may be in the future a zone where there is some necessary partial decoupling or fragmentation. It may be the case. There might be sound uh, security and public order reasons for uh, 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 having controls over trade or investment flows in these specific areas. And there again here, the like-minded countries at a minimum would be best advised to cooperate to ensure the convergence, at least, of their approaches in this area, again, to avoid unnecessary trade and investment tensions in that zone as well. That is one area, a set of areas, whether you're talking about export controls or you're talking about foreign direct investment screening for security purposes, which, again, can be the subject of a useful transatlantic conversation, and the structures have been established for that under the, the Trade Technology Council inter alia, building on a history of engagement uh, between the EU uh, national member states and the United States, among others, uh, in, this, in this space as well. None of you, um, and I didn't expect that, none of you um, said that re-foring um, and a complete decoupling is the answer to the challenges we are facing. Um, but coming back to you, um, Sandra, um, <laughs> a country which is so dependent on trade um, can also be uh, a, a, well, very resilient, but also very vulnerable. So what is, um, or what should, from your point of view, that is a question which just came in, um, how should Germany reduce its dependencies, um, diversify, and become more resilient? Yeah, thank you for the question. 
But let's say what already Dennis told a couple of minutes before, that the reform of our institutions, as the WTO, for example, is very important to get, uh, let's say, a basis to, to have a corporated uh, or corporation for setting standards. I think to keep our strengths and, and really to have the ambition to, to get a leader in this global competition for having common uh, standards, for example. This is the best way to fight these problems. And uh, we share our interests, we share our values, uh, in democratic values with Canada, with the United States and so on. And this really we have to push to get um, a strong union. And uh, let's say, I think uh, this is the biggest point to fight against China, to my point of view. Uh, other point, what means the resilience of, of supply chains? I think from a political side, we have three open points. Uh, I still once again want to, to get in with the, the skilled workers. This is a, a very big point that we uh, have via training, via long life learning, but also immigration, the necessary people in Germany. But also, second point, infrastructure is, uh, is very important. Uh, digital infra infra infrastructure, we already talked about it, but also energy infrastructure is a big point. And uh, third is all the bureaucratic hurdles we have uh, in Germany, but also in the European Union. I think we really uh, have to, to have a look at this and, and make it a little bit easier for, for the companies, because I think the companies, they know very well how to, to face the, the concurrence in a global context, but we really have to support them and, and make it easier for, for the companies to, to do their work. I think these three points are really important. Thank you so much. Um, coming back to the issue of the stress testing um, and the data, which is necessary for this. Um, one question goes to you, um, has it, um, one of our participants is interested in know, getting to know a little bit better how, how NATO is doing um, scenario exercises and stress tests to find where we are particularly vulnerable. Oh, thanks for the thanks a lot, Stormy, for the, for relaying that question. I, mean, I think these are are things that allies are beginning to get their heads around. Um, how we do this sort of together is still something that you know takes a bit of effort to get people to look at. We have a, a usual sort of annual crisis management exercise where we bring in more elements like this to get people thinking about some of these challenges. And you can expect in, in the in the in the years to come there will certainly be more of this added to stress test exactly um, how you know um, you know a supply chain shock in a crisis could affect the way the alliance for example makes decisions or how it interacts with different nations including how it interacts with its partners uh, these are things that that are on, on the agenda um, i think a lot of this is also happening within nations who are looking at um, different elements of you know war gaming or scenario-based discussions or stress testing where they are bringing some of these elements in, combining them, and essentially forcing people to think through the problem set. Uh, I think part of the problem um, with, with COVID, for example, was a, a failure of imagination. You know, we didn't really understand until we were in the middle of it, you know, what the impact could be. And remember, COVID is actually a quite a, quite a mild pandemic, uh, given, uh, given the overall scale of potential pandemics that, that are out there. Um, so I think that, that part of, uh, take the point very, very well, that stress testing is really important. Part of the problem, of course, is that uh, from a bureaucratic point of view, many of our countries, bureaucratic cultures don't do well with stress testing. People don't want to realize, well, I can't do this well. They don't want to be called out to say, well, you know, you didn't do well on that. So building a culture of exercising Uh, is something we talk a lot about at NATO for, with, with the allies, that it is important to exercise to failure, to pressure yourself. Um, you can keep those results confidential, absolutely, uh, but use them, use that kind of an example to get your people, your leaders, your decision shapers, your private sector thinking about these issues. And I think that's kind of the beginning of the conversation. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, nobody <laughs> likes to point out their own vulnerabilities. Um, and I think it also comes down to, to trust, to trusting each other. Um, in my very opening remarks for this conference, um, I quoted uh, the G7 um, uh, who agreed or who uh, vowed um, last summer um, that the G7 would work on resilience and build back better. Um, and I can also remember, however, um, when... Um, I was part of the economic resilience panel of the, of the UK G7 when we proposed stress tests um, and joint exercises, there was a lot of hesitancy. Um, and one of the arguments which I heard was, hmm, um, we could do this, but we also don't have the data for this. We don't have the data from the private sector because this also comes down to competitiveness. Um, and we are not so keen on sharing this. So for our last round, um, because this is also a question being asked, I want to come back um, to Martin and to Marion um, on the issue of do we have that data? Do companies have that data? Would you be willing to share that data under what circumstances so that actually technologies and systems could really be employed? Martin. Yeah, I mean, I think data can mean many things, right? So there are many different types of data. So it's difficult to, to make broad brush statements. We do have to recognize, though, you hear sayings like data is the new oil. What does that really mean? Data is an asset. Uh, it is an asset that that companies, of course, have to uh, uh, create or, or build up in a, in a legally compliant way. It has to be done in an ethical way, fulfilling the expectations set with the generation of that data, where the data is coming from. Um, you have to respect all of the necessary privacy laws. Companies have built information, and in some cases, they build business models that are unique, that are in part profitable because they leverage that underlying data and information. That may or may not be the same data that's used for these types of, of stress tests. Um, so one can ask, uh, some companies might feel like it's in their best interest to, to reveal and share either the, the source data or the results of that data, assuming that they can do so in a in a legally compliant and, and ethical way. Uh, I think the important thing is not so much what is the theory behind whether the data can be shared, but what are we really trying to, what's the question that's trying to be answered and, uh, and really engaging with customer or, or companies on, on that level, which could of course be a question around what is the resilience, how stress tested is their particular supply chain. Thank you so much. Um, and also for answering my very general or our very general question in a more specific and differentiated way. Um, over to Marion. Um, uh, what can the OECD do to allow for better, easier data sharing? I, mean, I think we, um, we can report on, on one of the best examples of how useful transparency can be. After the uh, great financial crisis, the G20 asked international agencies to build an international information platform uh, on food. And we built uh, something called AMOS, the Agricultural Market Information System that provides information on stocks, harvests, prices, and trade for major crops. And when the pandemic started, the COVID-19 pandemic, and tensions in markets arose, certain countries were considering to block exports of food, um, markets were becoming nervous, prices were going up. We could jointly, international agencies together, communicate that there was no need for panic, that there was no need to act against each other, that markets should be kept open. And that's what happened. And during the first years of the pandemic, the food markets did not pose any problem for uh, the economy. So this shows the power of transparency. It gives everybody equal opportunity to make risk assessments and to decide on their action, and it raises trust. What we have done uh, so far more generally when it comes to supply chains is to raise the importance of this issue in our um, tool for resilient value chains, uh, resilient supply chains. If you Google it, you will find that tool. We have uh, one item for called Build Trust. And under that item, we emphasize the collaboration of the public sector with the private sector. 
in moments of crisis, strong collaboration is important, including around data in order to raise transparency. Thank you so very much. Since we started a couple of minutes later, I'm giving us a couple more minutes uh, for the last round. Um, and um, I, we said earlier that there are different um, parts of building resilience. And uh, a imp very important part is um, identifying the risks we are talking about. So um, I don't want to end this panel in a very pessimistic way, but in a realistic way. And what I would like to ask all of you um, with a very brief and short answer, um, what do you think are the greatest risks or the great risk the value change are facing, which we really have to work on? Um, and maybe we do start in a reversed um, order, um, and um, let us start with um, Marion. Um, thank you, Stormy. We don't like to talk about risks because there is uh, such a self-fulfilling prophecy risk around this. Um, there um, is definitely has been in the past years a lot of policy uncertainty. That's not good for uh, planning in business. So stability and collaboration among governments is something that will help uh, supply chains. We have seen um, um, health risks unfolding. I'm not sure to which extent uh, that is entirely under control. There's a lot of discussion about possible climate um, disruptions. And uh, then there are, in addition, potential uh, risks coming from finance or from digital disruption. So the possibilities of disruptions are uh, plenty. We have gone through a period where we have seen quite a bit of shocks. I mentioned the global financial crisis. There has been a tsunami in the meantime. Um, in the Asian region that has disrupted supply chains um, uh, some 10 years ago. We, um, uh, we have gone through a lot of policy changes and now a pandemic. As societies, we have to manage to work together, um, remain uh, together in order to be resilient in the face of these types of risks. And there, I think I'm with Hasid, that's something we have to learn and to be prepared for in order to cope well with what is coming up in the next years. But overall, I will definitely want to remain optimistic and believe that we will manage. Yeah, thank you so much for also pointing at self-fulfilling prophecies and how important that is to consider when you do crisis communication. But that's for another panel. Um, over to you, Denise. Um, I think I would agree that we have to be mindful of geopolitical risks and various policy-induced distortions. And I can say this from a government perspective. Um, and on the other side, I think on the EU side, we very much trust the private sector to be capable of working on the resilience of supply chains uh, and to be able, and I think it has already happened, to reassess and when necessary reprice risks. So I wouldn't overemphasize uh, the risks or rather the inability, frankly, of market forces to actually adapt to these risks and therefore uh, create a situation which does not necessitate, in terms of the resilience of supply chains, a, a massive further government intervention in the, in the economy. That's not how we're looking at the, at the issues and the prospects in the near term. Thank you very much. Um, Martin. I think many of the risks have already been stated. So I guess what I would say is a risk is that we collectively misjudge the probability of an event uh, coming, be, moving from being a risk to act, something that actually happens. And so failure to, to really assess and, and capture the likelihood of that risk and whether it needs to be planned accordingly, uh, to me, I could see being a, a point of vulnerability. Thank you so much, um, Hazid. Yeah, I was gonna. I just wanted to again um, to applaud Marion's philosophical approach to this. You know, I think it's important to to think about you know what we can do to help mitigate crisis, and really that's a lot of what you know working in resilience is all about. It's about you know building your own preparation, um, and of course that requires a bit of a pessimistic approach at times. I have a feeling I'm sometimes the the Cassandra of, of my wing here in the headquarters, uh, where I'm always wondering about, well, what could go wrong? Um, but I guess from a NATO perspective, we do look at this from an all hazards perspective, that preparedness is something that you need, um, you know, in generic terms across these different areas of risk. 
Uh, but I would venture that, you know, geopolitical risk, I think, is, is, is an issue um, that we need to look out for. It is something that is back on the radar screen, if I can use the analogy, and something that we do need to look at. Uh, I'd say that, you know, pan the pandemic has definitely shown that, that this new environment that we're in, especially with climate-related risk or evolving pandemics potentially could also be something that we need to, uh, to be better prepared and, and, and think about. Uh, but, but I would very much applaud uh, and, and echo what Marian said about the need for stability and collaboration. And that, that element of collaboration and transparency uh, could not agree uh, more with that in terms of the importance of assuring uh, the public, assuring our partners, uh, and, uh, and I think very effectively building trust uh, among, among, uh, among like-minded uh, like allies and partners that, that, are, that are on the same side of dealing with a potential potential crisis or vulnerability. Thank you Thanks so again much. for the opportunity. <laughs> Thank you so much. And Dan? Thanks. I, I would say uh, horizontally, uh, although it, it, it may be challenging to identify particular risks with respect to particular products or issues, but, but horizontally, I think the, 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 biggest, the big risks come from the, uh, the underlying challenge of, uh, of non-market economy policies and, and practices in the, in the global in the global environment. As, as, as Denise said, you know the, the market will take care of a lot of these things, but not if there's a not if there's a big thumb on the scale. So I think that's uh, that's a, a, a big challenge. That I think will 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 we'll help address uh, and anticipate potential risks. Thank you so much. Um, Sandra, Sandra um, unfortunately, already had to, had to go. Um, you, I'm very sure you all remember uh, Rumsfeld's words on the knowns and the unknowns and the unknown unknowns and the known knowns. Um, you know all of this. So I hope that artificial intelligence will help us to better identify the unknown unknowns. And I hope to come back to the panel we started with, that we ourselves and our changes in mindset help us to address the risks we already know. So the known unknowns, which we know about, but we, which we decide not to act upon for whatever reasons. So I think it comes down to technology and us, uh, human decision making. Thank you so much for this really excellent panel. Um, I think we covered a lot of ground. We will now thank you so much for the panelists and please give them a big applause. And if you can see our digital um, uh, audience, they just raised their digital hands and did this. <laughs> thank you so very much um, for being here today. We do a 20 minutes break now to air out this room, to clean it through, um, and for you to get a coffee and also clean out. <laughs> so thanks so much and see you in 20 minutes time. So we would love to uh, continue with our exciting uh, program. Um, and with this, I would say um, we start um, and we are back. And um, it is a particular pleasure um, welcoming to you a very, very special um, guest um, for our spotlight talk um, on global digital governance and international trade. Um, and it is a great pleasure, Rebecca Greenspan, Secretary General, United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, UNCTAD, um, to welcome you today um, to our conference on resilience, artificial intelligence. And we just had a wonderful panel where we talked about the resilience of global value chains. Now we want to hear from you and from trade and from the UNCTAD and what you are doing, um, what, you're, um, what you are observing um, in international trade and international investment. Um, and uh, without further ado, um, I don't want to do lengthy um, introductions uh, because you can say everything so much better. I hand it over to you. The floor is yours. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Ah, and well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do have an audience here, so it's... Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to the organizers of the Aspen Institute uh, Berlin Conference and to the distinguished panelists and alumni and, 
and everybody there that is accompanied us. So really it's an honor to be here with you today, delivering this spotlight talk on global digital governance and international trade. As was said, my name is Rebecca Greenspan. I am the new Secretary General of ANCTAD, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. And you know that ANCTAD uh, over the years has proudly shone a light on the complex dynamics of the topic at hand. And it is my duty today to do justice to our devoted research, hoping as well to learn from you, from all these bright minds at the Aspen Conference. My spotlight talk today is divided in three parts. First, I will give you a brief overview of the state of the world with respect to trade and investment as I see it now. Second, I will share with you some untouched thought leadership on the emerging issue of digital governance and international trade with a specific focus on the issue of data flows. And lastly, I will propose some potential multilateral solutions that can produce more inclusive outcomes in this area. So let me start with the current context. Despite uh, recent headwinds, ANCAT expects the global economy to bounce back with GDP growth of 5.3% this year. This is the fastest, fastest growth we have had in 50 years. So we are not talking about a small rebound, we are talking about a robust rebound. But this number, however, is very deceiving because this 5.3 rate of growth is simply an average. And as you know, we live in a very unequal world. And when there is great inequality, averages hide more than they reveal. <laughs> the truth is much more complex and much less rosy for many of the countries of the world. And to remember Dickens, this is really a tale of two recoveries. Mm -hmm. Apart from China, most developing countries will recover much more slowly and will suffer more long-term damage than advanced countries due to this crisis. So the risk of a lost decade for many developing countries is real. We calculate the total cost of the pandemic for developing countries, including foregone income, at $13 trillion. In many advanced countries, this cost in the long term is almost negligible. Let me, uh, let me give you two, two examples. In the case of Germany, uh, the IMF estimates that by 2025, German GDP will be just 0.8% lower than what it would have been. And in the case of the US, it will be higher precisely because of the very important fiscal and monetary packages that have been put forward. Yes. Now, this is much, this is not $13 trillion in foregone income that the developing countries will experience. So, uh, let me let me go into some details in terms of trade and, and investment. You know, world trade, as everybody knows, has been greatly affected by COVID-19 pandemic. And the international flow of goods and services dropped around 5.6% last year. And international investment, and this is very important to take into account, international investment dropped 35%. Developing countries are bearing the brunt of these drops. According to our research announced, greenfield investments projects in developing countries fell by 44% in 2020. More worrisome is that everything failed. It was not only foreign investment, it was domestic investment. It was public and private domestic investment that were also seriously affected. It's very important for our 
a, a subject of digitalization and bringing you know more modern infrastructure to these countries because precisely that is what was most affected particular in key sectors for achieving the SDGs. So as a result, we lost much of the progress in promoting such investments for SDGs that happened since 2015. So we lost the progress that we have made in one year. Yes, mm -hmm. many countries, as you know, Latin America, for example, went back two decades in terms of extreme poverty last year, two decades. So there is something wrong in what we are calling development when you, lo when you lose two decades of progress in one year, yes? So uh, let's say it's true, and I think that the good news is that, you know, trade and investment since then rebounded. The recovery of the global economy, you know, has been strong, but still, you know, too divergent in terms of the countries. The second point is that the recovery of the global economy is really threatened by high freight rates and the disruption of the global value chains, which uh, is likely to continue uh, in coming months. This was the subject of the last panel, yes, so I won't go into much detail in here. But in terms of the freight rates, let me uh, say that according to our calculations, increased shipping costs may add to inflation 1.5%. Oh. Yeah, 1.5%. And uh, the problem, <laughs> the additional problem to that, that is already really high, yes, by any standards. But the thing is that, for example, in small island developing states, this will be not 1.5, but 7.5%, affecting food and essential imports in many of these countries. So there are many reasons behind the rise in shipping costs, and I don't have time to go into all of them. There are supply uh, factors and there are demand factors. I would say that in, in the supply side, we have higher energy costs. We have lower turnaround times at ports because ports cannot work 24 seven because of the health conditions and the sanitary you know, restrictions. Uh, and there are key parts of the global supply chain that continue to have COVID outbreaks. And we are seeing that precisely now with the new variant. So in the global side for, uh, you know, the global demand for goods is, is, is much higher than it was in pre-COVID times, uh, particularly in the advanced economies and in the US. So if you put these factors together, we have bottlenecks in the supply side to meet the same level of demand that we had before. And on top of that, demand also is much higher. And in the demand side, it has been said many times, the largest stimulus package, packages in many advanced countries is something to be considered uh, because money was sent to the households. And that is good because allowed household to really uh, face the, 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 the shortages in the decrease in income. But a bigger factor is a secular change in consumer patterns. Uh, and we know that e-commerce raised a lot because of the lockdowns and that produced a shift in the demand favoring goods instead of services. So the money couldn't be spent in restaurants so it was spent in things that you buy online. So all these factors are really pushing the cost uh, uh, increases in transport uh, since the demand for goods went up around 20%, yes. So all these factors uh, are, uh, you know, affecting differently different parts of the world. And uh, we uh, think that for this to go away, uh, there will 
we, we will have to go for investment that is medium term, not short term. So there are not very quick fixes <laughs> for most of this, but uh, what we have to bear in mind is that we have to differentiate the impact in the different countries to take the right decision. So let me go to the second part in terms of governance and the data debate, divide. So as we know, last year we will, we, we will be remembered among other things as the year people went online like never before. The great lockdown was also the great upload, yes. In regions like Latin America, for example, e-commerce grew in nine months, what investors expected to be in three years. Yeah. So the share of e-commerce in global retail sales surged from 16 to 19% in 2020. And the share of digitally deliverable services in global services exports went from 52% to 64%. This also boosted data traffic. Yes, global internet bandwidth rose by 35% in 2020. The largest one year in increase in the, almost in the last decade. So as a result, never have people's life been so dependent on access to real time, time data and technology. From monitoring and controlling the spread of the pandemic and the way we carry out our daily activities, such as working, studying, shopping, to the manner through which scientists have been able to develop new vaccines in record time. So this is another lesson from the crisis. We have really a success in science and really a failure in governance. <laughs> and you know, this is, this, we, will, we, we have to preclude that this will be also the story in the digital economy. Yeah. Now, beyond issues of technology infrastructure, this increased reliance on data is also generating concerns. And we have to talk about the concerns too. For example, related to privacy infringements, implications for national security, and the possibility of the criminal abuse of data. For example, a Cisco survey in 2020 found that 60% of people expressed concerns about their data being protected uh, uh, in, the, uh, in, in the apps that are tracing uh, their activities and that even were used for the pandemic. So there, there is a mistrust being built that may affect a lot what we want to achieve. Not surprisingly, data has emerged as a key economic and strategic source. There is today a race for economic and strategic leadership in terms of harnessing data with the United States and China as the clear front runners. Let me give you some numbers on this because it's, they are very striking, you know? China and the US account for half of the world's hyperscale data centers, half. They account for 70% of the artificial intelligence talent. And they account for 90% of the market capitalization of the largest digital platforms. So for example, only four companies Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, Google and Alibaba account for two thirds of the world cloud infrastructure revenues. Not only flows, revenues. And only five platforms, Alibaba, Amazon, Facebook, Google and Tencent receive more than 70% of global digital advertisement. So the concentration that we are seeing in the industry is something that we have to take into account for any governance proposal for the future. Most developing countries and most smaller businesses obviously have limited capacities to transform data into business opportunities and into economic and social development. So this places us at a disadvantage in a world economy 
that is becoming increasingly digitalized. In a word, the conventional connectivity related divide, digital divide, is rapidly being compounded by a growing data divide. It's not only digital, <laughs> it's a data divide. The extent to which people use the internet range from more than 80% in Europe to less than 30% in Africa. And the using even lower, is even lower in rural areas. We know that. And you, you, we know that less than half of the least developed countries have data protection and privacy laws in place. Many developing countries also lack the relevant skills and other resources to make productive use of data collected. So what I want to say is that in this new configuration, developing countries risk becoming mere providers of raw data to global digital platforms, while paying for the digital intelligence obtained from their data. So let me, let me put an example of oil. This is the same as oil producers giving their petrol for free and then paying from, for the gasoline. <laughs> and that is an asymmetry that we will have to face. This is like a new way of reprimarization of the economies without any revenue, yes? So this mm -hmm. brings me to the last part of my talk the problem of global digital governance and international data flows. So the issue could not be more important. Data can be used to generate a lot of social value and also private profits. Both are true. How large these benefits will be, how large the social value will be and how they will be shared depends greatly on the rules agreed upon to govern data and data flows and on our capabilities to transform data into digital intelligence for the common good. In fact, how we handle data will do, will to a great extent affect our ability to meet the sustainable development goals themselves. A growing numbers of, of international agreements are dealing with data flows. The international debate on digital governance is currently at an impasse, reflecting diverging views and positions. Current regulatory frameworks tend to be either too narrow in scope or too limited geographically. With the UA, the EU, the US and China, the world's three largest economies, each dealing differently with the issue, with different is emphasis. Some emphasize the role of the state, the others emphasize the role of the private sector, and others emphasize the role of the citizens in the governance architecture. So we need a new balanced global approach to data governance that meets a middle ground solution. Extreme positions on cross-border data flows will not be helpful. Let me say that <laughs> at front, yes? As neither strict data localization nor fully free data flows are likely to satisfy most countries' development objectives. So global governance is important that will avoid fra further fragmentation of the internet and will enable global data sharing to mitigate widening inequalities, to enhance trust in the digital economy and to deal with the market dominance of some digital platforms. As of today, no one has all the answers on how to deal with this. And there is certainly no one size fits all solution. What is needed now is for us to come together across nations, across disciplines and across stakeholder groups to engage in structured policy dialogue that facilitate progress in this area. We believe that the United Nations is the best platform for this dialogue to take place as it involves all relevant parties and relies on universal membership. So dear friends, it is more important than ever to embark on a new path for digital and data governance 
the current fragmented data landscape is the worst of all possible worlds. We risk missing out from the huge social value digital technologies offer and to lose whatever we have gained through privacy breaches and cyber attacks. Fragmentation only helps those who do well in a world without rules. For this, we need coordination, we need leadership, and we need basic agreements. So as in the case of climate change and pandemics, only a global response can develop appropriate governance framework. And the process of developing such frameworks should start now. Here again, to deal with data and its opportunities and risk requires a global response. I thank you. Madam Secretary General Rebecca, um, I can only say wow. Um, I, when we were planning this conference, I told my team I want to have her in the conference uh, because I don't want to make this a discussion just among Western developed countries, but I want to make this into a global discussion. Um, and thank you so much for sharing your insights. Um, since we do have the pleasure of having a real audience um, here, um, I want to ask our audience, I think we have time for maybe two questions, um, to take the opportunity to ask Rebecca a couple of questions. And I also, yes, please. And the mic is uh, coming. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Wolfgang Kleinwächter. I'm a professor emeritus and I was a, a member of the ICANN board and the Global Commission on Stability in Cyberspace. Uh, you mentioned the UN as the main platform for a global governance system. Is the roadmap on digital cooperation proposed by Secretary General Guterres the right way? And what do you expect from the proposed global digital compact? Thank you so much. Um, and um, what I also want to do in our conference, linking the different panels with each other. So, Joanna, may I call on you? <laughs> and we do have to disinfect the mic in between. That's why it always takes a second. Okay. Um, so Science-based. Um, <laughs> The, uh, <laughs> sorry, a bit ironic there. Uh, yeah, uh, the, I, what I'm, I was, Blown away by the talk, thank you so much. Uh, I did have a question towards the end when you talked about that we have to do this without rules, um, because I, I guess it depends. Uh, obviously, the international uh, community is in some sense an anarchy, but there are some kinds of rules and structures. Uh, and the EU has shown ways that you can coordinate uh, within nations sometimes too, so uh, or within groups of nations. So I was wondering, is it really with no rules at all, or, or is there something we can do to create, I mean, you said we had to have agreements instead of rules, but I, I guess I was confused about the, the structures, or, or can, is there anyone who can provide some kinds of rules? Okay, and just one second, because one thing I always also like to do is um, giving our young ESPEN members the opportunity, our um, Nachwuchs, to ask a question to somebody who they wouldn't usually meet. Um, uh, Linda or Ina or Annika, do you want to ask Rebecca a question? Don't be shy. <laughs> I guess they are too shy. All right, <laughs> then we turn it back to you. <laughs> okay, uh, first uh, uh, to Wolfgang's uh, question is, is very important. First of all, Wolfgang, I think that it's very important that this issue was put forward by the, sec by the Secretary General in his proposal of our common agenda, looking for the future. And he calls it our common agenda. And a big part of that had to do not only, as I said, with the digital divide, but with all the implications. <laughs> and that's why I really dig farther in the data flow problem. So I, yes, I think that the Secretary General understands that this was not dealt with, with in the SDGs agenda. And, 
It is not that the our common agenda is a different thing, but it brings a more futuristic perspective to issues that can be very important for our common future, as the Secretary General says. And in a way, I really think that we need to go uh, beyond the global digital compact. I have to be honest <laughs> in here, because for example, for example, we need the scientists to come and help us in, the, in, in, in understanding what is happening and what are the regulations and uh, evidence-based and uh, of, of what are the solutions for the future uh, with respect to what I refer to. But the scientists are all in different places and many of them in the industry, yes, in the platforms. It's the same that happened with the environmental problem, yes, where when we gather the, the, the scientific crowd around finding solutions and giving us the evidence in, in, with respect to the environment and, and climate change, we were able to go ahead in many of the solutions and draft the agreements that we need to go farther. I think that we need to do the same this time. It's not only, a, a, you know, the, a global compact a negotiation. We need to put together all what is needed to really go deeper into the problem that we are facing. Because at the end, you know, there is this concentration of power also <laughs> that is happening. And, and it's also a democratic question, <laughs> you know, that the, the one that we are facing. It has to be multidimensional. It has to be multi-stakeholder. It has to be a, a complex, unfortunately, <laughs> complex for the solutions to, to, to be the right ones. So, uh, I think that it has to receive more attention. And I think that the academic world has to come much stronger, you know, in this really to give us the practitioners <laughs> and the politicians of the world a more thoughtful, you know, research to go ahead. So I think that we have to go beyond, yeah, in, in short of the global digital compact. It's important but we have to go farther. With respect to uh, the second question, I, I didn't hear the name, but I, I'm sorry, probably my Spanish English <laughs> was in the, <laughs> in the way here, <laughs> but my, my, my words were fragmentation only helps those who do well in a world without rules. I am all for rules and agreements, all for rules and agreements. They have to be intelligent rules, <laughs> yes? And they have to be intelligent regulations. And remember, I come from a small country. So small countries, we only will survive in a rules-based world, yes? We won't be able to protect ourselves uh, in, a, in the power game, uh, with a power game world. We need agreements, rules, and regulations. Thank you very, very much. Um, and uh, the person who asked that question was, uh, um, was Joanna Bryson, who is a professor at the Hertie School, School here in Berlin for technology um, and ethics. So, Rebecca, I know that you do have to leave. Um, thank you so very, very much. Um, I am a great fan of uh, UNCTAD, and um, I, I laud the work you're doing on investment, investment screening, investment protection, but also particularly on digital trade. And I always tell my business colleagues, do look more at UNCTAD, not just at the WTO. Um, and uh, I, I'm pretty sure that you have now a lot of a lot more fans um, in, this, in this audience. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. And with this, um, we do um, need to do a five 
very short five minute break. Thank you so much, Rebecca. <laughs> um, we are, because we need a new setup up here, um, because we have um, one of our panelists in person, and our moderator is also going to be here in person. Um, I heard that he is a, went a couple minutes late, so bear with us. Um, he's going to be here. He's in the cab. He's on his way. Um, and then we are going to start um, maybe a few minutes late. So, we are running a couple minutes late, um, but we want to continue in our program. And um, we will just wait a couple more minutes for our um, audience, on site audience, to come back into the room. We already sat here, um, the coffee and the, um, the little snacks are too good outside. <laughs> In Germany, we would say the Teilchen, die Teilchen zum Kaffee sind äh, zu gut. Und wenn man es österreichisch sagen würde, würde das noch viel charmanter klingen. Wie heißt das da? Sahnestückchen. <lacht> Sahnestückchen. Ja, oder die Zucker. Zucker. Aber das Mikro ist schon an, das schweige ich lieber. Mhm. Ja, und wir haben noch so ein ganz klein bisschen, glaube ich, Rauschen oder Echo. And I'm also seeing a very special guest who has just arrived, um, Gabriela Ramos, one of our um, keynote speakers for tomorrow, who is going to join us also uh, for the dinner tonight. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Gabriela, for already being here. Um, and we selected um, a, a seating neighbor to you, my, 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 the prior director of the Aspen Institute, um, and um, to keep you company. <laughs> So, um, we continue with our conference, and for this we can open again our Zoom room so that we will also see our two digital panel participants. Ah! And there we go. And with this, um, this is not my show. Um, this is Matt's show. And with this, I hand over to the moderator of this panel, um, Matthew, Matthew Matt uh, Kanishnik. And he is, you are, Chief Europe Correspondent um, Politico. And uh, thank you so much for making time joining us today and taking over the moderation. Um, this is the time for me to watch, enjoy, and to relax. <laughs> well, thank you, Stormy, for the invitation. It's great to be with all of you here in what I suspect will be one of the, the last in-person events of, of this year, unfortunately. Um, obviously, those of you tuning in online aren't here in person. But nonetheless, you can feel a bit of the uh, in-person vibe, hopefully. Uh, we're going to be discussing what is really one of the most important issues of our time. Uh, and I love the title of this session. It could be a, a Politico headline, Friends or Foe, Digital Sovereignty and the EU-US-China Triangle. And uh, to join us to discuss this, we have really a, a top flight transatlantic panel here. I will start on the other side of the Atlantic to introduce Molly Montgomery, who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State uh, at the Bureau of European and Eurasian Affairs in Washington. We also have Renaud Fedel from France, who's a Ministerial Coordinator for Artificial Intelligence in France. And to my right here, uh, live in Berlin, we have Roderich Kiesewetter, a member of the German Bundestag, and more importantly, a colonel in the Bundeswehr, or former colonel, retired colonel. Once a colonel, always a colonel, as they say. Uh, so I, I would like to uh, start off to, to get the discussion going here with a, you know, kind of more, more general uh, question to, to all three of you. And, um, you know, I mean, as I said at the, at the outset, this is, this is an issue that, um, you know, I think is top of mind both in Washington and certainly in, in Europe at the moment. Um, and, and in June of, of this year, as many of you in the audience will, 
Remember, EU Commission President von der Leyen and President Biden officially launched what is known as the EU-US Trade and Technology Council, which is a very uh, difficult uh, idea to get your head around if, you're, if you don't know the, the details. But the point of it was to affirm cooperation across the Atlantic on, on this field that we're discussing today. So maybe just to start briefly with you, Molly, from an American perspective, uh, wh what do you think are the, the most pressing digital issues at the moment where you could imagine a closer cooperation between, between Europe and the US and, and where is that most needed? Absolutely. Well, and first of all, thanks, Matt, for moderating. And uh, thanks to Stormy and the entire Aspen team. It's great to be with you here today, although I wish it could certainly be in person. Um, you know, we think the Trade and Technology Council is a really exciting development. And uh, the initial um, ministerial earlier this fall really demonstrated its potential and the broad array of issues um, on which we seek uh, deeper cooperation with the EU. Uh, but to answer your question directly, I think, you know, number one for us at the moment really is finding um, a resolution to uh, Privacy Shield and its successor agreement um, that is going to provide certainty to the thousands of businesses and research institutions that rely on transatlantic data flows. And that really is going to be a durable solution that protects privacy facilitates data flows and ensures our, our collective security. Um, second, I would just say that we're really seeking closer alignment and cooperation on tech regulation. Uh, we recognize that we, we won't always agree in terms of the approach, but I think our objectives uh, are have a lot in common, uh, particularly in the Biden administration. And so we believe it's really important for us to work toward complementary risk-based, innovation-friendly approaches uh, to regulating the tech market, uh, and that we really need to ensure that we have interoperability and compatibility um, between uh, our regulatory legal systems um, on both sides of the Atlantic. And then finally, I would just say that we need to work together to preserve and defend our vision of the internet as open, interoperable, secure, and reliable for our citizens. And that also means ensuring the development and deployment of sensitive emerging technologies is done in a way that strengthens our democracies and institutions and defends against authoritarian approaches such as the PRCs. Um, so I could go on, but I'll, I'll stop there. I look uh, yeah. forward to talking more about the TTC. Yes, exactly. We've got, we've got plenty of time. Um, but I would, I would like to, to come to kind of an opening impression also from Renault, because, uh, you know, listening to Molly, it sounds like, well, this should be pretty easy. We can all kind of, you know, get going on this tomorrow. But it is actually quite complicated because there are differing views on a lot of these, uh, a lot of these issues. How, how do you see things from uh, Paris, uh, Renault, in terms of the transatlantic cooperation on the digital frontier? Well, we both have been challenged in uh, 2017 by by other by other competitors in the, in the field of AI and digital that claim to be the, at the form at the forefront of uh, digital innovation in 2030. And I think we need to take both necessary steps to remain uh, Europe and, the, and the, our ally in the United States and Canada at the frontier of the technological wave. That means to have and to train more talent to retain them to attract more capital, to invest more, uh, and also to strengthen our markets. Uh, we have, we in Europe, uh, we clearly are, at the moment are lacking, lagging behind, and we uh, there are some imbalances are for us to resolve. For instance, our digital market it may be not be unified enough, and at the same time, we also need to correct imbalances in our relation, uh, for instance, with uh, with North America. Uh, today in Europe. Uh, there are some very powerful companies who, had, who act as, as gatekeepers, and sometimes they don't always refrain from a kind of olig oligopolistic behavior. So there is this new legislation uh, drafted by the Commission, which is very important. And also, uh, I wish we would uh, spend much less time with, with uh, the, the hassle of dealing with unilateral legislations, uh, dealing with data, and, and, and these kind of um, Legislation uh, take a lot of time and energy that we could focus more on acting together in, in order to uh, to tackle the the, the the challenges of the future. 
Uh, as the, the Trade Council, which was very interesting uh, setup, we have a common understanding, both at the OECD and GPI. There, will be, there has been a mapping of the principle, but now we, get, we need to, to get more to the bottom of things. Uh, the AI Act is doing, it, is doing it in one way, the NIST and the US are doing it in another way, but I think even if on one side there's legislation and on the other side there's voluntary um, normalization, I think we, we need to work together because we know that AI, for instance, needs a lot of uh, re-engineering methods due to, the, to its statistical uh, nature. So that's a lot of work. And I think we can overcome our difference of approaches and getting these things done. That's what I wanted to say uh, introductory. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Roderick, um, you know, when, when the TTC was announced uh, back in June, a lot of people looked at it and said, well, there isn't you know, as much sort of meat on the bone there as, as you know, a lot of people were, were calling for. H how do you see this situation? What do you think the focus should be, should be here? Yeah, thank you very much indeed also for the invitation. I really feel delighted also because it is in the representation of my home country, Baden-Württemberg. So thanks a lot. Um, nevertheless, we need to look uh, more European and more uh, transatlantic. Um, therefore, I really would align myself. Germany cannot afford to be in a position of arbitrariness. And therefore, the latest IT law, the IT security law, which passed in April this year, was quite outspoken. Nevertheless, it was delayed for more than one year, which gave room to those who supported some Chinese devices in this. So what we need is a clear position aligned with our European neighbors, and we need a stronger transatlantic cooperation. Why? We, need, we cannot only create new bodies like the alliance of like-minded nations or the alliance of liberal democracies. We also need to foster this, as just uh, Mr. Videl mentioned, to create a common market for these security devices. And we also need inside Germany, for example, a clear announcement of uh, some uh, business, of some enterprises which are in contact with uh, Chinese business and that they also bring up it to the, to the government. And therefore, it is also important that we need to notify the government if there are signed some new contracts uh, for critical 5G components. So in this context, I believe that with the new law, Germany is aligned much closer with Paris and with Washington than it was in the past. And therefore, I believe that the new government will uh, have to develop this even clearer. We need also for our economy clear clarity. And also, we need uh, that there is a chance that we Europeans exchange much more amongst each other on the European level. And we need, uh, with the view of more transatlantic cooperation, some levels of engagement where we have the chance to exchange not only views, but to create common standards. So this, I think, is a better position than we had two years ago. Uh, M M Molly, what, what do you think of that? Do you think that we're moving towards really common standards here? Because I think in Europe, a lot of people uh, look at what has come out of Washington on these issues over the past couple of years, and they think, well, the US just wants Europe to, to do what the U.S. wants Europe to do, <laughs> and uh, you know, if if it, if that's not using uh, Huawei 5G, then you know, uh, the the expectation is that uh, every everybody drop it. And Roderick was talking about the 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 situation in in Germany at the moment, uh, but you know, there there's also language in 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 the in the, in the German you. law which uh, you know, would allow for, for some use of, of, of Huawei components. So it's a long-winded way of asking you, what, what does the U.S. really want of, of, of Europe right now on this front? Absolutely. Well, I would say zooming back out to the triangle uh, that's really in the title of this panel, I think what we're really focused on is ensuring that the shape of that triangle um, reflects our common values and uh, the fact that we are much, much closer to each other, even when we have differences, than we are to authoritarian regimes, and I would say specifically the PRC, but also Russia and others. And so 
that's why we've really focused on the TTC, but also conversations bilaterally to try to have really a constructive approach to talking about um, regulation that uh, is originating in the EU, whether that is the DSA and the DMA or the AI Act uh, or the EU's Cloud Act to try to find complementary approaches because we recognize that whether it's on 5G standard setting, um, AI, investment screening, supply chains, um, we really do have common interests and we need to be working together um, because we are you know, facing the same sorts of challenges. Um, and so uh, overall, I would say that is very much the approach of the Biden administration. I, I won't speak for the previous administration. I think certainly the tone has changed. But on issues like 5G, I will say that a commonality, even though that tone has changed and, and we've really turned a page uh, in transatlantic relations and certainly bilateral relations with Germany, we do continue to really sound the alarm in terms of the risks that are posed by untrusted vendors in critical communications um, technologies and that that just can't be mitigated. So, but we continue to have those conversations bilaterally um, in a constructive and respectful way uh, and really look forward to working particularly with the new German government um, as it develops its approaches to all of these issues. Uh, Renaud, uh, coming back to your, to your specialty, which is uh, artificial intelligence, obviously, um, you, your country uh, adopted this artificial intelligence strategy back in, in, in 2018, which I think by European standards makes you pioneers uh, in, this, in this regard. Um, and just to review for people who aren't familiar with the strategy, it, it has three main objectives, which are to strengthen the uh, attraction of, of talent and investment to, to pull people in from, from outside France as well in this area, to disseminate AI and data in the economy, and uh, to promote an ethical model of uh, AI, which as we know, might be the, the, the biggest challenge of all here. But looking back over the sort of nearly three years that you've been uh, doing this now in France, how would you say this, this strategy has developed so far? Well, I, I wouldn't claim France is especially original or pioneer. Germany has done its own strategy, Sweden, the Netherlands. Uh, and then there, is the, there has been the coordinated EU plan uh, revised uh, in April this year. What I think is uh, the future of industry will be based uh, a big part on, on AI, which has so far all the characteristics of general purpose technology. Not only, it's not the only technology, there will be other technology, maybe quantum um, and, and others, but it will be very important. Uh, and so we, that's why we have invested a lot in order to, uh, to make emerge the new uh, industrial base of the future. And 2021 uh, is really the marking of a takeoff of the European uh, landscape. We, we see it in, in these investments. Uh, Germany has tripled, France has doubled, uh, and all of the countries. And, and in total now, there are, so that something is, is happening. And at the same time, we need, we need to help this, uh, this space to thrive. For instance, in, in, in the US, uh, you, you have a very interesting uh, and lots of startups are going to us because lots of the innovative actors are from the medium or startups world. And they say, oh, in the US, they have the Small Business Act. And in Europe, we, can have, we, can, we don't have such a, such a tool. And it's not just because then we cannot contest the markets. We cannot grow enough. So that's something we should, we should, um, we should strive. We need an industrial policy, not against uh, our partners and very close allies, but we also need to be able to strengthen our industrial base and to make it, uh, to make it thrive uh, in the 21st century. Uh, at the moment, we can see that a lot of European talents are going to the US. That's a good thing because uh, obviously, uh, American companies are very innovative and something is happening and research in AI is happening in the private sector. But at the same time, we don't see often enough uh, the reversal trends. So this is also something we need to correct. Some of the explanations are us, because uh, sometimes uh, we are not uh, as, as innovative or some of our regulations are too strict. 
And sometimes it's also imbalance that can be uh, talked with our, our American friends and, and, and redressed. So yeah, I think really this is something that we, sh we sh try to address in our strategy. And also it's not a zero sum game. So that's why in the new phase of the strategy, we will invest much more in talent. Uh, at the moment, there is a general shortage and not only in, uh, in data scientists, also in developers in software. Uh, we, and we need to train more people. Uh, and we need to, to, uh, to, to, to uh, integrate more our startup communities across Europe. Uh, each time I, I talk to a startup, they say, I want to go to the US and not enough. I want to go to Germany or to Sweden or to the Netherlands or to Spain. And this is a mindset we need to change also. But I mean, just a, a quick follow up on that. I mean, given that the US has been this magnet for a lot of European talent and investment in this area. And you know, we see that, I think, in Berlin as well. Whenever there's a successful startup here, they tend to turn to US venture capital money as soon as they get a little bit of momentum, um, because that's really where you know, the, uh, the, the market is. Um, wh why not promote more transatlantic cooperation here rather than a kind of you know, Europe go it alone strategy, especially since in Europe, uh, you're also competing with the Russians and, and the Chinese in this space. But actually we, 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 are, we are an open economy uh, and, I, I, and we have seen it in, in the last two years, some things are changing. Uh, VC investors are coming now to Europe. They have doubled their share. And now they don't, a, a, a few, three or four years ago, each time a VC venture, a VC uh, came to France to see a company, they said, "Oh, we are going to finance you, but you need to relocate your your headquarters in the U.S." Now we see more and more uh, that they have understood that they have some some value to bring, and that they can we can keep the headquarters in France or in Germany, and, and that we can uh, we can do a, a much more balanced cooperation. That's also something to do. we don't want all our assets to systematically being relocated. That, that's something we need. If you want to compete with China uh, or with Russia, we need both to be strength, the US and Europe. Otherwise, uh, we won't be able to compete with these guys. Uh, Roderick, coming, coming back to you, this is clearly a challenge that Germany uh, has, has as well. Um, and I, th I think uh, a lot of people in the United States at least, um, Maybe not Mali, but other other people I know would, would look at Germany and say, "Well, they want they want to have it both ways." You know, China's become Germany's largest trading partner, um, and you know, which is obviously uh, important to the German economy. But there are also uh, some concerns about uh, what the Chinese are doing uh, elsewhere uh, in in the region and around the world, and even even in in Europe, and uh, what some see as their sort of malevolent behavior. Uh, Germany has so far kind of avoided provoking the Chinese on a lot of a lot of these issues. How, how sustainable is that? Do you think in this uh, digital sphere, if if you and Germany want to both cooperate with the United States going forward, especially in the security sphere, which is existential to to Germany's security and to Europe's security, uh, and also continue to kind of curry favor with the Chinese. Yeah, well, first of all, I, be, I think that it is really important also to show the public that the biggest share, the greatest share of our trade has the European Union. So in common, the European Union is a stronger partner than China. So, and, and after China, immediately uh, the United States uh, is, is the third in sequence. Although so, the US is still the largest export market. Yeah, that's true, and, and we should be aware of that. And we have only shares in China focused on automotive and some other specific uh, um, mechanized industry, some, some other uh, specific areas of business. But it is not an overall um, challenge in China because we have much more investments inside the European Union and in the United States. So just to delineate that a little bit. A second remark. Um, I'm a member of the French-German Parliamentary Assembly, and one of our projects is a common, combined French-German artificial intelligence project, which will be located either in Baden-Württemberg, in Saarland, or in Haute-Lorraine. So we are on that. So th there will be an, a challenge, there will be also a chance for young scientists all over Europe 
to bring in their knowledge and it is up to us to create an innovative atmosphere inside the European Union that our startups are trustworthy and that they see they are also ex uh, accepted in, in the way of their, of their business and uh, their conduct of their business. Because otherwise, uh, we see it in Germany, we, we invest a lot in, in the knowledge of the universities or a lot, uh, a lot in the knowledge, I think the, the micro doesn't, no, it works again. Um, so we invest a lot in the, in the knowledge and in the, in the innovative uh, power of our young people, but then they see a better environment in the United States because the research and development atmosphere, the climate is much more uh, inspiring there. So. Uh, we should not take it as a given that young people stay here, invest here, and also try to create uh, their business here. We have too high barriers, uh, too many thresholds, um, which we need to overcome for a more common and comprehensive uh, approach for those who invest in, start in startups. So we have on the one side the investors, and we have on the other side the young people. We need the brains uh, for the future. As regards competition, we see that the, the challenges we, we see every day in the Bundestag, for example, um, like uh, the ATP attacks from Russia, like attacks from China as well from universities, we need a kind of competition as well in the universities, not to hack foreign countries, but uh, to, to create an atmosphere where our own young people are willing uh, to, to better compete with, with uh, like-minded in other European states and in the United States. Um, but what Russia is doing and also what China is, is, uh, is trying to achieve is an, a climate of competition in the universities uh, where they try, financed by the state actors, uh, to hack in our systems. And in, in the German debate, we focus too much on data protection, on individual data protection, but not in the data protection of our small and medium enterprises. So there is also a gap, uh, not only in perception, but also in, in the willingness and the political will to bring, to close these gaps. Uh, our federal office in, in this context, the uh, BS, BSI, is willing to do that, but a lot of enterprises avoid to, to come into contact uh, with this federal office because it's also a question of honor and a question of silence uh, to be mute about uh, attacks in this context. Therefore, I, I plea for more courage, for a more encouraging approach amongst uh, the European states, and I hope that we, after the election in France, might also have a better uh, cooperation with Poland so that the Weimarian Triangle uh, can become a catalyst in this context also for the Eastern European countries. So we need a broader approach uh, instead of only looking into domestic issues. I, I believe that in Germany, after the hacking of, of the Bundestag and after severe losses in some um, significant enterprises, we have a change in the attitude now. So you're referring to the, the uh, Weimar Triangle, that's the cooperation between Germany, Poland, Poland and France, mm -hmm. uh, kind of uh, a diplomatic format mm -hmm. there. Um, but, but Molly, when, when you look at Europe on these issues, uh, if you think about, you know, if you really want to address a burning issue, you mentioned the privacy shield, the data issues, and all this other kind of stuff. Uh, what, what is your first port of call? Because you, you talked about the importance of bilateral relations, uh, but ultimately a lot of these issues will be decided uh, in, in, in Brussels. Um, has, has that gotten easier, uh, do you think, to, to deal with, 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 we don't have anybody from the commission here, but has it, has it gotten easier uh, to, to address these, these matters in, in Brussels, or do you prefer the bilateral approach? Absolutely. So I would say we fully understand that, that we need to be engaging both in Brussels and in, in key member state uh, capitals. And, you know, we view uh, the Trade and Technology Council as a key forum 
to have these conversations. And I think one of the benefits of the TTC is that it's really catalyzed a lot of engagement between um, not just the State Department, uh, but also our trade representative, uh, Ambassador Tai, as well as our Commerce Secretary and other actors within the US government with their counterparts um, in the commission. And there's really a regular exchange there on all of these issues. So it's not just the ministerial meeting of the TTC, uh, you know, that is our, a one-shot deal. Um, we really are working day in and day out on these issues with, with the commission. Um, but I also would say we fully understand that you know, member states play a really key role. And we have heard from a lot of member states that they wanna make sure that they are engaged with us on these issues. And so uh, whether it's Paris or Berlin, um, whether it's Warsaw um, or beyond, um, you know, we are really having robust conversations on the full spectrum of issues. I mean, Privacy Shield, as I mentioned, is for us extremely urgent. Um, that is something that's being dealt with uh, in a separate channel from the TTC because we were already engaged in negotiations before that was established, uh, but certainly something where we are engaging the commission regularly um, and negotiations are ongoing, uh, but also having conversations with member states uh, to ensure that they understand just how important uh, we believe this is uh, to everything that we are trying to do together in the digital space to ensure that we have reliable data flows and that we're able to to move forward on that front okay i i, I do want to open the the floor to questions uh in, in a moment so prepare your questions if if you have any i did have another question for uh renault though before we get to that which is re responding to uh what what molly was just saying i mean I, you know I, I think that uh you know U europeans often forget the fact that for people looking at europe from the outside it, it does look like this kind of cacophony of, of, of voices. Uh, j just yesterday, we, we heard uh, Josep Borrell not speaking specifically about uh, digital issues, but speaking broadly about Europe's positioning towards the United States and towards China. He talked about a hedging strategy, uh, which, which sounds more like a financial tactic and investing uh, uh, strategy uh, than, than diplomacy. Um, but Renaud, to you, um, you know, there obviously are, you know, is tension here on, on a lot of these issues. Do, do you think that Europe really has its act together and can speak with one voice on these central questions, uh, be it the, the privacy shield or 5G or whatever the, the question might be? Well, we always have a more difficulties because we are we have a, a, a set of nations. I am I really feel truly European. I was raised with a house house partner in Germany, and I love it when I go to to Finland or, or southern uh, Greece and spend uh, my money with the same currency. Uh, and at the same time, uh, it's more difficult to act, I, I, and that's why Europe is now needs to uh, to develop a more sovereignty approach uh, with in, in an industrial policy. Uh, a common defense policy in a world where, even including the US, they have said that uh, their interests are sometimes a, a bit more uh, uh, pointed at Asia than in Europe. So we need to, to, to take uh, on ourselves. And even in the digital world, when I look at uh, what Europe has to boast, sometimes we, I think, even in France is not above uh, all other members, we sometimes uh, not enough feel European and act Europeanly. Uh, in the tech world, if you take uh, IMEC, if you take uh, ASML, if you take the providers in, in the Nordic countries, if you take uh, Germany's uh, excellent um, robotics that now is turning to, uh, to AI, uh, we have a lot of strengths and we need to uh, have a more European mindset. And, and I think uh, when the digital, digital economy is, is turning, when the economy is, uh, as a whole is turning to digital, we also have to signal to our friends that it is normal for us to claim that taxation is located where activity is. It is normal also to claim that our small, our middle stand, our small businesses uh, can be protecting like the American ones have a small business act. Uh, and there is a, really an issue about the cloud. Everybody is turning to the cloud. All activities are turning to the cloud. But there is a problem if the cloud business and uh, information and secret trades are not protected from unilateral uh, legislations. 
And then the, the only uh, authority that, can, that has the power to claim to resolve this is the Court of European Justice, and it won't, in, it won't dodge the, the, the fact. So there will not be an agreement unless we resolve this. And it, it's not only a question of Europe. It's a, it's a, it should be a, a joint endeavor. Okay. Um, I the, had... Because these, these are core assets. These are, our core assets are turning to the cloud. So we, they, we have, we have yeah. to be sure that they are protected. Right, right. I mean, I guess the missing piece here, though, Roderick, is, is China. Uh, because you know this is often portrayed as a uh, sort of discussion, you know, as I have today, between primarily between the United States and Europe, which I think it is, because on a lot of these issues, China is more sort of this specter somewhere in the background there. Nobody really knows what they're up to. We're all worried about <laughs> what they're going to do. And yet there is a lot of tension in this bilateral relationship, mainly because uh, this space is so dominated by American companies, as, as Renaud was just uh, alluding to. Um, wh what do you think the outlook is on, on, on that front? I see a real security challenge in this context. Um, just an example, the American government asked a big American, very well-known enterprise to improve by artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence their drone systems due to the collateral damages uh, the Americans experienced in the last years. Well, I think, and, we, I think and, we mostly imposed the collateral damage and yeah, others but, experienced it. But this yeah. enterprise denied to take over this task from the American government due to the fact that the greening of international investments is also including investment in defense. So I don't, uh, it, it's a very, very well-known enterprise, one of the biggest in the world. But no Chinese enterprise would deny such a mission from the Chinese government. So in the long run, I see a gap. If we, in our greening of investments, in our assessment of sustainable investments, avoid to create an atmosphere that the security industry is willing, or those who have tools in the artificial, artificial intelligence which might help the security industry, if they deny because of the um, investors' uh, relationship. On the other side, the Chinese see and, and have a great overlook about our situation. And they will go into the gaps we have. Second remark, one of the lessons learned uh, during COVID is, is that we need to improve our resilience. And in parallel, the United States have created the US CHIP Act. And recently, the European Union announced uh, the idea of a European uh, CHIPS Act, uh, which aims to have a share of about 20% of the global chip production by 2030. So we have lessons learned, and we also try to, to bring it into practice. But I believe that China will be faster, and they will use our, or will abuse, our weaknesses in certain parts. But we should not see this as a weakness. We should convince those enterprises who are able to support governmental decisions by artificial tools, artificial intelligence tools. Uh, otherwise, in the, in the strategic competition, we will open the gap for others. And we should also, when we look to the European Union and the Green Deal, I must mention that, that, that the European uh, endeavor must be more comprehensive and inclusive. The European Green Deal opens the door for China, Russia, Saudi Arabia, and to a certain extent also Turkey, with regard to the decarbonization of Kosovo, of um, Bosnia, of Algeria, and Libya, who are not able to decarbonize. But the Green Deal allows only to, uh, to cooperate with these countries if, if they show the willingness. So I would like to put this on the level of artificial intelligence and of uh, digitalization. If we lose these countries, we lose also brains to China or Russia. Therefore, we should survey and check our political ideas also in other fields that they have a contribution to a more comprehensive security understanding. OK, thank you very much for that. Um, I would like to open it up for questions now. Um, maybe in the room here, there's a question in the um, third row. 
and we'll come to the first row. Should we, should we collect questions? Yeah? Okay. Um, why don't we start here then in the uh, first row and then we'll get to Thank you. Thank you so much and great to be here with Stormy and with all of you. I'm Gabriela Ramos. I'm the Assistant Director General for Social and Human Sciences at UNESCO. And I want to bring the conversation to the business model of artificial intelligence because what I hear from all of you is how much the, this triangular cooperation is trying to um, preserve and advance the competitive edge of these regions and, and try to advance a model for digital transformation that is uh, according to our values. But we just approved a, a recommendations on the ethics of artificial intelligence last week, 193 countries, and I haven't heard anything in this conversation about what do we do with the dangers of the downsides of artificial intelligence and the business model in terms of privacy, in terms of how data is gathered, how data is used, and therefore I would like to hear more about these uh, human rights ethical <laughs> issues of artificial intelligence, if you're dealing with it at all or not. Okay, yeah, that's a very good question. Maybe one more question and then we'll tackle those. I'm, I, hi, Joanna Bryson, uh, Heritage School. Um, I, I'm really glad I'm going second. This is sort of a related question, um, but also from the business perspective. So in uh, June of this year with Helena Malikova, the Director General of Competition of the EU, uh, I published a paper that looked at these questions, the, the sort of myth about, or, or potential myth about the, um, the AI Cold War. And, and was it true that there, there were graphs that were going around showing that just in terms of large market capitalization companies, uh, only the U.S. and China had any, had any skin in the game, basically. Nobody else could touch them. They were dominating the world. And so we looked instead at the number. We knew that actually uh, the U.S. in fact innovated antitrust because it's dangerous to have too large of companies. And so this is where the tie-in is. But I'm now talking on the economic perspective. Innovation comes out of a strong SME sector. It's been shown over and over. And uh, so we, we looked at what was happening in terms of patents registered at WIPO and also at um, market capitalization of companies that had listed at least two WIPO patents in AI in one of the subcategories of AI in 2019. And what we showed was that the US was dominating the whole rest of the world combined on those two measures. Um, however, China and the EU were not so different from each other. And interestingly, the rest of the world, which is not being mentioned in this triangle, we drew a quadrangle of some form, uh, the rest of the world actually had more than China and the EU combined in both WIPO patents, listed patents, and market capitalization. Now again, I think that's partly because Saudi Arabia and Japan had been encouraged, and actually Switzerland, had been encouraged in this large market capitalization strategy, which I'm not sure if that's a good thing. But my, my, I didn't only want to give you data, I actually wanted to come back to a question about that, which is that you know, we talk about a lot of talent going to, to America, and a lot of it does, although living in Berlin, believe me, a lot is coming here right now too, including from American companies. But uh, the, uh, is, is, isn't that part of what's destabilizing potentially America? We, all, we were just hearing about the previous presidency. We don't, know what's, we, we don't know if the lack of antitrust actions in the United States right now is a good thing. So even if it's true that Europeans and again, colleagues from all over the world are going in and building the AI that's affecting the whole world, is it necessarily the right thing? Maybe they're getting too much fun. <laughs> and, and maybe this, there's an awful lot of people in America who are poor and don't have health care and things like that that are suffering from the lack of regulation there. Okay, thank you. Um, we're going to have to run through these questions. Maybe, uh, Renaud, would you uh, take the first one on the ethical uh, impact of AI and, um, you know, whether we should be paying more attention to that uh, already. I think it is for a lot of people kind of a, uh, a, a vague fear that they have. But certainly in the hands, as we know, of, of certain governments around the world, uh, it can be very frightening. And, and companies. I, 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 I would congratulate uh, Gabriela on the, on the, on the success of uh, UNESCO having uh, drafted this, uh, this uh, ethical framework in such a large 
set of countries. And I, and I would like to say that uh, we are not dodging the question because uh, Europe will issue, has proposed its first regulation, which uh, is heavily skewed towards taking into account these, uh, these issues. Uh, and it will impose a lot of uh, constraints onto European companies or, in, or import in companies or, so, or companies uh, in the, operating in Europe. Uh, and in the past, uh, the GDPR has not prevented uh, uh, companies from abroad investing to Europe, so, so we are dealing with these issues. Uh, and also uh, the Global Partnership on AI, which is still a young organization, has 10 projects uh, with, with the US, with Canada, with Mexico, with Japan, Korea, and we are already uh, trying to invent uh, or to share ideas or projects on these issues. So I think uh, some line of work is really being done there. Um, and at the same time, I also think uh, this is something we should uh, tackle jointly, Europe and, and, uh, and the America. Uh, we need to also help other countries which are less technologically advanced, not to be, uh, to be seduced or having uh, the only resolution to go to China to, to, to have their technology. We have to help them acquire this technology. We have to do uh, AI for good also. For instance, we know that some states have very weak infrastructures and they sometimes uh, of observation can can help and so it's also a responsibility of our own companies to help provide services sometimes for free or for cheap to to farmers to local industries uh, and this is probably something uh, where we will need to develop new cooperation policies economic development policies uh, and where they will need to be more digital and more ai uh, based okay thank you thank you very much um I think you, you've really put your finger on what, what is you know, probably the, 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 the most important issue here, how this technology is going to be used. But I wanted to come to the other question as well. Molly, do you want to take uh, the, the second question on um, you know, whether there should be more antitrust regulation and actions uh, in, in the US around uh, you know, I think not not just AI. You were speaking more 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 broadly uh, on you know the, uh, the the digital sphere that um, that the United States has created this kind of uh, group of robber barons, modern day digital robber barons, who are going to uh, you know lord over the the rest of of the world. Sure. I would just say that, you know, I think this administration in, in some respects is still developing its approach uh, to those issues, but certainly in the executive order that the president issued uh, on competition policy, it did include some specific concerns about excessive concentration in the tech sector. Um, and obviously there are a lot of proposals on Capitol Hill in terms of uh, how we might address those issues. And so the administration is really working with Congress uh, to find appropriate ways to achieve objectives such as protecting privacy, promoting competition, addressing disinformation, you know, and, and addressing uh, the concerns that Joanna has, has raised. Um, on the AI question, I just wanna point out um, that one of the working groups that we have in the Trade and Technology Council is specifically on the misuse of technology and the impact on human rights um, and other uh, and security concerns, et cetera. Um, and so the AI issues that were raised um, in the previous question are very much part of those discussions. I know we've talked specifically about surveillance, about social scoring, um, you know, other uh, concerns in terms of the ethical use of AI. And so I, I just want to note that that is, that is really at the heart of a lot of the conversation in the TTC. Um, and, and I think it goes to the point that was raised earlier as well in terms of, uh, you know, ensuring that these technologies are used uh, to in line with our values and that we also are promoting resilience and protecting and strengthening our institutions, and that's both within you know, the United States and the EU, and I'm the first to admit that we have work to do um, on our own democratic institutions um, to strengthen them and to improve resilience, but also, as was mentioned, in places like the Western Balkans and other areas that are particularly vulnerable to influence from authoritarian regimes such as the PRC and Russia, and I think that's an area that is, is very ripe for US-EU cooperation as well. 
Thank you. Um, we have run out of time. I just wanted to give you, Roderick, the last word on this issue because you're a military man. Um, you know, we hear now that the Chinese have the ability to identify people from up to 100 meters wearing a mask uh, in, a, in a matter of, of milliseconds. Are, are, are we naive in, in the West on these issues and thinking that we're going to, you know, be able to convince people to play by the rules as this technology develops? Or is it just inevitable that uh, you're going to have actors like China, other authoritarian uh, regimes using this technology as they uh, clearly already are? Uh, if you look at what's going on in Xinjiang with the Uyghurs and so forth, uh, mm. to uh, to repress uh, people. As a politician, I'm also used to look to the positive sides. Nevertheless, there are some challenges we have to cope with. We will not avoid China becoming a leading or one of the lead nations in artificial, artificial intelligence. Um, in November 19, I had the chance to accompany our foreign minister to China, and we had a chance to, to visit a, a uh, new upcoming business in, in mobility. A young lady with 30 years was the founder, and she had 300 million customers and 30 million drivers. And our foreign minister asked, what's with data? What's about data protection? And she said, why data protection? We want to improve the offer to our customers, and therefore we need open data access for all of us. And then she said, well, we have also about 86 million handicapped people, and 84 of them, we have data. We, we, they are interlinked with, with us. And then we can offer best practice for these people. And we can improve this also by artificial intelligence tools. So there are two worlds of understanding. I believe, at the end, we need to have an ethical framework, and we need to convince our people the, it, the Chinese government does not need to convince their people, they control their people to a certain extent. And this might come at the end, in a decade or in two decades, also to a kind of turmoil. Because you cannot afford to have Uyghurs, Tibetans, Taiwanese, Hong Kong, and other challenges. So this social control at the end might not lead to success in the end. So we have to be very patient. But we need to be convinced about our own ethical standards, and we need to communicate them. And the idea, and also Aspen could do this, and, and also other think tanks, we need to better advertise our system to our population. And we have to make our system more transparent in this context, and then we will be more competitive. And the place where competition will take place will be, in the next two decades, will be Africa. Because China, these days, Africa as a doubling of their own market, because population will double in the next 25 years. And we see Africa as a continent of concern. But we should see Africa as a continent where we can prove our standards. And therefore, we should be a little bit more consistent, a little bit more coherent, but much more convinced in, in, in the way we promulgate our policies and in the way we create data protection in this environment. And then, probably, the young scientists who have a choice will not be seduced by Chinese international enterprises. They will be convinced and not be seduced by, by our ethical codes, if we are attractive enough. Well, thank, thank you. you very much for that optimistic uh, view. Uh, we're going to have to end it there. Thank you, Roderick. Thank you, Molly, for joining us. Thank you, Renault in Paris. And thank you to everybody who tuned in online and who came here today. Thank you very, very much. Um, since we are running quite a bit of uh, behind the schedule, we are continuing right away, so no break. Um, thank you so much. Um, I would like to hand over Ah, she is still um, in um, getting the cable and the um, headset. Um, but in a second, uh, Wiebke is going to take over the moderation. Um, the next panel is also really exciting um, because we are leaving the federal government level and moving to the state-to-state -state level on the transatlantic um, relationship. And our um, participants are already... Um, 
I think they are already in the Zoom room. And um, if our technical team can let them in. You, you still need a couple of minutes? Oh, okay, all right. So we do need five minutes um, before we continue. I still would say um, just, just stay, um, otherwise we will have big, big trouble getting you back into this room. <laughs> So, alle, alle gute Dinge sind drei. <laughs> so, we are continuing um, with another exciting panel, and we are leaving the federal level to the state level. And I'm handing over the moderation now um, to Wiebke Wartenberg, who is our program officer at Aspen for tr our transatlantic program. And uh, Wiebke, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Stormy, for this kind introduction and a wonderful afternoon to everyone here in the room and to everyone who is joining our AI conference virtually. And welcome to our closing panel for today. I'm very happy to have the opportunity to be here today and to lead this discussion for the next around 60 minutes. Let's see how long we can go. Um, and the topic of this talk is state-to-state -state exchange, the future of digital cooperation. Innovations in the field of machine learning are fueling hopes that artificial intelligence could significantly improve the resilience of our societies and economies. And you've already got a lot of great input on this today. But at the same time, new digital technologies, such as in the field of AI, could significantly uh, pose new challenges to us. They change how we work, how we communicate, how we inform ourselves, how we produce. In other words, they change how we live. And to harness the opportunities brought forward by the digital transformation um, and to give it a legal framework, new laws and regulations are required. And not all of them are passed on the federal level. On the contrary, um, the, the subnational level plays a very important role here. Individual states are important agenda setters and can serve as laboratories of democracy a term coined by former U.S. Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis, who believed in the power of states to test new and innovative policy approaches. And it is also clear that we need international cooperation to realize the full potential of AI and to deal with its challenges effectively. And with this in mind, the Aspen Institute initiated the Laboratories of Democracy Initiative, a transatlantic exchange program for German and American state legislators. And we bring them together to facilitate a values-based discussion and exchange of ideas on how to tackle common policy challenges on a subnational level. Digitalization being the focus topic of our first cohort. And I'm very pleased to say that today we are joined by some of the participants of our first cohort to discuss the risks and potentials of digitalization and more specifically AI. We want to look at four areas, at workforce and education, at digital infrastructure and mobility, at cybersecurity and data protection, and at climate action. In our discussion, we want to learn about the role of individual states get a glimpse of, at the policy recommendations that have been developed in this program and in the spirit of labs of democracy, learn from each other. And with this, I'd, I would like to introduce our panelists. On the American side, um, I want to say hi to Cecilia, who joins us virtually from California. Um, Assembly member Cecilia Acquia Curry um, is a member of the California State Assembly and has a long track record of advocating for expanding broadband technology infrastructure for California's rural communities. I am also very pleased to welcome another legislator and Democrat from the West Coast, Senator Ruven Carla. He represents Northwest Seattle in the Washington State Senate, which is home to many tech companies such as Amazon and Expedia. Ruven also shares the Senate Environment, Energy and Technology Committee and is a true leader on tech policies and climate action. Cecilia and Ruven, good morning to you and thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. On the German side, let me welcome Joschka Knut, who joins us from Kiel. 
Joschka is a member of the state parliament of Schleswig-Holstein and a member of the Green Party. He is spokesman for economic affairs and the labor market, startups, digitalization, and a couple of other issues as well. Hi, Jos Joschka. Also with us is Christian Fliesek, member of the Bavarian parliament for the Social Democratic Party. He has worked on many issues surrounding tech policy, both on the state and the federal level. And last but not least, Andrea Lindlow will be joining us just a little bit later today. She should be here in a few minutes. And Andrea is a member of the state parliament of Baden-Württemberg uh, and a member of the Green Party. And she was recently appointed state secretary in the Ministry of State Development and Housing of the state of Baden-Württemberg by Minister President Winfried Kretschmann. Thank you so much to all of us, for, to all of you for joining us here today. And before I dive right into the discussion with our panelists, let me just share that for the last 15 minutes, we would like to open it up uh, to questions from all of you. And for those who are watching online, please use the question button next to the live stream or the live chat to send in your question anytime, and my colleagues will make sure that I will receive the question. All right, with this, I'd like to get us started with the first and more general questions to all four of you. Uh, from your point of view as state legislators, what are the greatest challenges states face regarding digitalization and specifically AI? And I would like to start with our American panelists. So Cecilia and Reuven, if I could ask you to take up this question first. Sure, I'll be more than happy to start. Um, thank you again for including us today and it's an honor to be with all of you. Um, you know, I, I sat down for quite some time to try to think about what's most important and it really came to some really basic things. Um, some of the challenges that we have, you know, despite the fact that we're in California and we're this, the tech hub, they call us in, in the United States, um, state and local governments find it really difficult to attract and retain civil servants and with tech backgrounds. So expertise is one of the challenges that we have. You know, people expect high salary here in California. We have a hybrid office culture. And it leaves uh, the states um, in a position to only get idealistic or no one at all to work in, in the industry. And then we have equity. You know, while worthwhile, um, states must take more um, diligent approach to ensuring digitalization and AI applications serve every resident of our entire t our, uh, area. Um, I find that that's one of the really difficult things, particularly I represent a rural communities and it's very hard to find um, people that um, to make it sure it's equitable uh, in digitization. And then there's also the evolution of, uh, of everything going on and the AI trends are some of the fastest growing and iterative that we have seen in IT forever. Um, the state government processes are notoriously slow. If you try to get anything done in the state of California for any of our departments, it takes forever. Um, they're slow and it's based in old, old practices. So from regulations to budgeting, to procurement, to employee training, um, states have a difficult time in making this transition from our antiquated systems. And then quite frankly, on the policy front, most poly policy discuss discussions relate more to consumer protection and privacy rather than to deployment of AI. And so, um, we really depend upon some of our tech companies to often successfully defeat, they're, they're defeating some of our overly broad um, proposals because we continue to limit technology at the statewide level. So I was glad you asked this question because it gave me some time to think about after our visit there is how we need to do some changes and um, that we should be listening to other, not only countries, but other people that can add uh, to, to um, prom promoting some of the ideas that we have here in California. But it's it's tough, so I call it expertise, equity, evolution, and that's what we've got to work on. Thank you, Cecilia. And before I hand over to Ruven, I just want to welcome Andrea Lindlow, who has just joined us. Hi, Andrea, it's good to see you uh, and welcome. We are just talking about what challenges states face when it comes to digitalization and AI. And with this, I'm going to hand over to Ruven. Thank you so much, and it's a pleasure to be with everyone. Uh, I would like to echo uh, those comments from Cecilia. I, I think we're living in a transformational time where uh, artificial intelligence is so rapidly escalating its impact across every sector of society that our regulatory and our policy and our political frameworks are simply unprepared. Uh, we know that at the national level uh, in the United States, 
that it's very difficult for Congress to take a stand on the weather, uh, much less do a comprehensive policy framework associated with regulating a lot of these core issues. And so now more than ever, uh, there's an argument that what uh, some people call subnational in terms of states and provinces and regions is really supranational because arguably we're the actors who are leaning into the work of building a framework. I think in the area of artificial intelligence, when you marry it with cloud computing scale, we have really a transformational issue around uh, Internet of Things, IoT in, uh, in smart cities. Uh, issues and applications around climate are one positive potential element if done well. But ultimately, uh, everyone I think knows at its core that we have uh, deeply unsettling challenges around privacy, around security and the integrity of the data, uh, and also the ability to translate those application into value, uh, as Cecilia said, for real people living real lives. And so figuring out ways to improve the quality of our global supply chain, the risk mitigation, the financial transparency of the fact that many of our largest financial institutions in the United States are continue to finance fossil fuel investments while making claims for net zero. So our sort of a radical transparency is made possible by a really deep embedded embrace of a lot of the applications that AI enable. At the same time, the foundation that we talked about around privacy and security has simply never been more essential. And we, we don't have a GDPR framework in the United States by any stretch, uh, even, that, even, even though that framework has challenges and issues, at least it's a, a guiding principle. So those are some of the issues that we're struggling with. Uh, for, our, for my state as the home of Amazon and Microsoft and Boeing and Starbucks and uh, Costco and many uh, global uh, uh, thought leading companies, I think there's an expectation of thought leadership in the area of AI and, and uh, digitization, but we, uh, we struggle with a, a lack of a partner in the public sector in many, many ways. Thank you very much, Ruben. Let's hear from our German panelists what they regard as the biggest challenges. And Joschka, Christian and Andrea, if I could ask you to also uh, take up the points that your American colleagues have just raised. Uh, do you see similar challenges or other challenges? Shall we just start? So I, I, first of all, I got to say it's great to see all of you again, and it's a pleasure to, to join you today. Um, greetings to Berlin. I guess we would all love to be with you in Berlin. So um, greetings from Kiel. And um, on the one hand, I can only echo what um, Ruben and Cecilia just said, because the challenges they face in the States are extremely similar to those we face in Germany. But um, on the other hand, I can maybe just dive into one or two points they just mentioned. If we, for example, talk about um, the use of AI, not just generally, but the use of AI by the state, for example, is a huge, huge issue. And it's an issue the state hasn't dealt with yet. So um, what we are working on, for example, in Schleswig-Holstein, what we were talking about when we had our labs of democracy in Stuttgart was um, the regulation um, of the use of AI by the state in a way that it is enabling the use. But that means that we don't only have to use uh, to regulate the use of AI and to enable the use of AI for the state, but that we have to have a legal framework that also allows us to generate and use the data we have as, as a state um, for AI, because no AI system is working without data. So that is a key issue in, in Germany, in Europe, because on the one hand, we've got regarding private data, the GDPR, but then there's all those public data. There are so many sensor data, for example, we as a state have regarding the environment, regarding traffic, um, social data, et cetera. And I guess that is an interesting like, field we got to deal with on how to make those data available for AI and not just for private AI systems, but also for public AI systems and to gain trust in those systems. Because if we as a state um, make decisions based on AI systems, people will question those decisions. And we got to have a framework for a way to deal with those decisions. And 
um, um, to, to make people accept those decisions. So that is a big deal. We are working on, for example, at the moment, and then we could talk a lot about infrastructure because, I mean, Cecilia, we, we are coming both from the rural areas. Yeah, we, we need digital infrastructure. We need fiberglass, for example, for people to be able to use systems. And that are, we, are, we are often like very deep in the technical details of systems. But on the other hand, we as a state need to guarantee the access to digital solutions by providing the infrastructure for the people. So that is a huge issue for both of us as well, I think. Thank you, Joschka. And over to you, Christian. We can, so, ah, yeah. Yeah, first of all, thank you very much um, to have the opportunity to be with you here. And um, greetings from Munich, um, so from the very south of Germany. Um, well, what Joschka said and what Ruven and Cecilia said, um, it's also important for our experience here in Bavaria. Um, so I just want to make uh, some other points. So we are talking about digitalization and AI. Um, Bavaria is a, a, a big uh, a country, a big state. So we have many rural areas. My um, constituency is Passau. So it's a little lovely city, but we have a lot of rural areas around us. And um, when it comes to the expansion of the digital infrastructure, we have really uh, a big problem at the moment. So when it comes to mobile communication, fiber optics, 5G, um, we are lacking at the moment, not so much the funding, uh, the money, it's uh, more about the workforce for, for implementing and running such an infrastructure. So um, when you look at fiber optics, for example, at the moment, we, we don't have enough companies and we don't have enough uh, 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 workforce in the companies in order to to bring to implement this infrastructure that's a very big issue at the moment not only in the south of germany i think in in all over germany it's the same situation and um if we talk about uh, the public administration, of course, we should also um, uh, talk about uh, how can we upskill, so Cecilia mentioned it, how can we upskill the workforce in the public administration? So they are working at the moment in a very analog way. So it's not only about the, the, the hardware, it's uh, about the mindset of the people and it's about the upskilling of the people. And um, another very important thing is what Joschka mentioned. So uh, AI, uh, AI based applications uh, need data and they need only a big amount of data. They need uh, good data, uh, high quality data. So we have to think about our data regulation framework, uh, which is a uh, um, Datenschutz, so it's a data protecting law. We need a data traffic law, and we need uh, uh, to talk about how can we also upskill the quality of the data used for AI based applications. I think this is a very important issue. Thank you. And Andrea, do you have any challenges to add to what your colleagues have already given to us? Well, uh, um very fun to see you again and greetings to Berlin. And um, I agree with you, my dear, my dear colleagues. And um, just want to point out that uh, Joschka is totally right in um, addressing the point, what about public AI systems? And we need a framework, but who will set up this framework? No, I don't think that the state level will manage this. Uh, that, the, do the states have to do this because no one else does it? Or do we do a big federal um, work group? I'm, I'm not sure. Um, interesting in your points. Well, from a Baden-Württemberg point of view, um, AI is not about competition. Of course, competition and research and development uh, about uh, the innovative heads of the world and so on, as you know, but in terms of economic policies as well. As we are um, the manufacturing hub, you know, we have our uh, automotive industries and engineering, and we see a big, big um, change in the value chains. So, um, 
to get a new system, a far more faster system in um, in getting a real research input into this, uh, even into the small and medium companies. That's a big point of us about AI changing the value chains that you know we live from here down in the southwest of Germany, of course. Thank you, Andrea. And you made a very interesting point that sometimes it's not even clear where's the responsibility. Should states take action or is it something that the federal government should do? And I want to first take a closer look at the regulatory environment of digitalization and AI. And Reuven has already mentioned it, that when it comes to privacy and data protection, the federal government in the United States didn't yet provide a good framework for that. Um, and I would like to start with a California perspective on these topics. Cecilia, your state, California, is a leader on data protection and privacy rights. And could you maybe tell us a little bit what your state has so far achieved on these issues? Yeah, sure. And um, we can get into the weeds about this, but I'm not the expert on that, but I will tell you. So California has become a leader in this. Um, we did a California Consumer Privacy Act back in 200, 2018, and then we realized that we needed to fine-tune that, and we fine-tuned it in 2020 with our California Privacy Rights Act. And so that has not completely been implemented yet. It gets implemented and won't be effective until 2023. So we have some time. Um, and like I said, whenever we go back to these things, it's all about implementation. I mean, we can make policy, but you know, what's the problem? How do you fix it? But the ultimate is how do we implement as, as everyone has been stating. Um, we've also appointed a um, governing board for our, pri for our privacy agency, and they are taking the re reins on the regulatory Process. So now we have someone that's going to be in charge and be able to kind of direct traffic on this. Um, this should be a familiar way that, in a way, to our German counterparts, as it took years for many of the goals of the GTPR to be seen by consumers and for enforcement to begin in each con uh, country's privacy. Um, the federal government in the United States has been slow to react to all of this. And, and um, you know, as Reuven said, we have not done a good job on this at all. Um, other states have followed some of the lead that California has done. We have, uh, obviously, um, Senator Carlisle, I'm sure, will tell about their multi-year effort, but um, Virginia and Colorado are starting to pass laws. Um, but, you know, for me, it's, it's hard to enact some of these things when each state's doing something so different, and it would be nice to have it across the board. Um, so some of the pr proposals that have been pr proposed to Congress uh, the more the focus has been placed on trying to foster cohesive state statutes and avoid a uh, federal exemption, pre-exemption. So, you know, it's kind of a fine dance we're doing here. So, but beyond privacy, we work hard in our California legislature to support innovation so the regulatory environment is not overly aggressive towards new technologies. We still want that flexibility. We want new technologies, but we don't want to hinder anybody. And some of my, uh, my colleagues have introduced different legislation trying to put um, limits on the governmental use of technologies like um, automated de decision making. So um, the legislature, legislation, um, our consideration are all kinds of types of propos proposals are going on. Usually it stretches over multiple years, over multiple um, sessions, and it takes a long time to get these things mainstream. And so there's a lot of frustration. Um, I do want to make one really quick comment um, when you're talking about making sure we can get fiber into different areas of your community. Um, we have been um, in a very short period of time, um, we passed um, some legislation that California, the state will actually uh, install fiber up and down the state of California. And in two months period of time, they've already identified 18 areas that they're already doing digs to put in fiber. And at the end of December, we'll have it, the state mapped so we can determine where along California state highways that we can start the putting fiber in, whether it's in the rural areas or in our urban areas that uh, the inequities exist. So I just wanted to remind you that there are ways to do all of this. It's just it's going to take all of us to have these conversations. 
Reuven, let me get you to respond to this as well, because I know you have led efforts to enact state-level consumer pr uh, protect, privacy protection measures in Washington state. And, and I know you've also looked at uh, the California regulation and at the general data protection regulation of the European Union for this. Um, you've also championed regulations on AI, so I would be interested to hear what your view is on what role states play in designing regulation for the application of AI. Cecilia has just mentioned that uh, sometimes she thinks it's a little difficult if states have different regulations on these issues. So I would be interested to hear your perspective on this. It's absolutely true that a state level regulation is not ideal. No one is advocating uh, that. The problem, of course, is that our national government is simply incapable of adopting anything remotely close to a GDPR type of framework. Mm -hmm. uh, the legislation that I drafted in our state and tried three times to get into law and have uh, been unsuccessful is really uh, the, the policy foundation of legislation that has passed in Colorado and in Virginia. And the, where it came from, of course, was a a robust mapping between California's law and GDPR and other best practices from around the world to try to capture some of uh, the, the important regulations that we need in terms of rights of consumers to access their data, the right to opt out, the right to delete that data. The problem as I see it with the GDPR model is simply that uh, you, you in effect grant companies and other entities Uh, more permission to utilize your data by opting in, by granting them that approval, you are effectively transferring uh, your rights in a, in a very robust way. So a very robust opt-out that has uh, a global opt-out mechanism, I think is more, is, is an essential piece of it. So regardless of the tactics of the policy, we also have traction in the area of facial recognition. Our state was the first state to pass meaningful facial recognition uh, legislation that requires public entities to transparently disclose what their proposed use of the application mm -hmm. is, what the integrity of the technology is with an open uh, interface to a neutral third party so that the accuracy of the technology can be tested for bias across uh, racial and other sectors. And so we've made some good progress on that particular issue. But ultimately, uh, you know, for us as a country to uh, to have a state level model is, is uh, you know, not anyone's preference. But we live in a difficult time for uh, the lack of federal action in many areas. And of course, climate is the most obvious example where we see a, a real lack of action at the national level. Thank you, Ruben. And climate is definitely a topic that we want to get to. Um, before doing this, Christian, the Bavarian state government has adopted a large number of measures to support digitalization and also the development of Bavaria into an internationally leading location in the field of AI. And I would ask you to tell us a bit where you see success, success stories in your own state and where you think more needs to be done. And getting back to what we've just talked about, since you've worked as a legislator both on the federal level and the state level, it would be interesting to hear what your view is on the division of responsibilities between the federal government and the state government. Yeah, so let's start with uh, Bavaria. I think um, a success story in Bavaria is um, a, a program, a research fo program funded by taxpayers' money. It's the so-called high-tech agenda for Bavaria. And um, it was announced in 2019 and Bavaria is now investing, spending about um, 3.5 billion euros in, in the next uh, two years in order uh, to, to, to fund AI uh, research and AI research centers and also to fund the SuperTech program. Um, the, the goal is that Bavaria uh, is to become an AI district centered in Munich, but we have about 100 new AI chairs at all universities uh, around uh, Bavaria. And um, 
Um, I think when you hear 3.5 billion euros and you compare it with California, it's not a big figure for Cal for the US or for California, but within the, the German states and also I would say within the European Union, it's a big figure. And uh, we hope that there will be also then more private investment on that for we need of course therefore uh, a taxation mm -hmm. framework which uh, which uh, gives uh, tech or private money or private investments um, uh, um, the opportunity to do so um, we are lacking that at the moment on the federal level but uh, I think this is a really success story that we, um, uh, with all parties in the parliament in Bavaria, we are behind this uh, research program and um, we are expecting a lot of that. And so that's a very, really important point. Um, on the other hand, when it comes to the competences, so it's... Um, I don't want to give you now a course in German constitution law or, cons or how, what are the competences, competences in Germany in the, on the state level or on the federal level, but I think we can learn a lot from the evolution of data protection law. Um, it started, I think, in the 70s, uh, um, in the last century, in, in a, on, a, on, a, on a state level. So I think... Hesse was the first uh, state who, uh, who, who, who was uh, regulating the data protection. And then it went from the state level to a, a national level, on a federal level, and now we are uh, on, a, on a European level. So I think we can learn how things are, are going on. We, we don't have to wait on for an international law on AI regulation that will not come. So there are too many differences on how we should regulate that. So I think um, the approach is that um, those states or countries who are important markets in a, on a global on a global market, they should go on and um, and then I think what I learned when it when I when I when I was um, uh, with data protection law uh, also by profession always working, I, I learned that. A global company with a global business model doesn't want a balkanization of its business model. So they look what is the toughest regulatory model, what is the toughest regulation in the world, and then they implement this regulation in their whole uh, global uh, business model. And I think this is also the chance for European countries to go on with AI regulation. And it starts, I think, that's what we learned from the data protection law, it starts on a state level. So I'm looking very positively in the future that the state level can go on with this uh, challenge. And Andrea, similarly to Bavaria, Baden-Württemberg is also striving to harness the opportunities brought forward by artificial intelligence. We have just been in Stuttgart as part of our Laboratories of Democracy initiative and could see this firsthand. And AI offers a lot of opportunities for the economy, but this has, of course, also implications for the workforce and for education and learning opportunities. And I would ask you to maybe elaborate a little bit on the experiences, experience of your own state, Andrea, when it comes to learning and training. What is Baden-Württemberg doing to really make the workforce fit for a 21st century economy? Well, um, in um, training of, um, uh, of the workforce, you have uh, three agents, let's say, uh, because it's uh, the workforce itself, the, the um, the employers and the state. And it's not that easy to figure out uh, who's re responsible for what. Um, and so um, we uh, try to establish, we have traditional networks on this and we try to establish um, new models and um, that we have a good, that we have a uh, collaboration of small and medium enterprises on um, training of the of the workforce in terms of digitalization. It's digitalization, it's not especially AI. And uh, that we are funding these networks for small and medium enterprises uh, by our state. Um, that's a, 
that's the newest point uh, in this. We see that um, that there is a that it tends to be that there is a gap um, between the big companies and the small, medium, and medium enterprises. Um, it's not that the small and medium enterprises are not innovative. They are innovative, but they tend to, like they don't have time at, or they don't have administrative power uh, to establish um, a good learning for the workforce on really, really new issues um, on, on a broad, uh, in a broad way. Cecilia, I know education is an important topic to you as well, and I know you have to leave uh, a little early today. So I want to get you to respond to the question of education and training as well, um, and maybe get us an American perspective and California perspective on the topic. Where do you think uh, there is more need for action when it comes to really equipping the workforce for the world of tomorrow, um, when it comes to upskilling for lifelong learning? Thanks for that question, because it is one of the top um, items that I've been talking about and that I'll be working on a policy this year. There's no doubt about it that it's incredible that what we can do with technology, but we don't want to leave anyone behind. And unfortunately, some of the jobs that, uh, that we're going uh, that are, are new um, don't have a road, um, a path to bring others along. And so I, I must admit, when I was in uh, Germany, it really it came to me is that when I went and uh, noticed the, um, the uh, Mercedes Daimler um, manufacturing plant is that so many things are different and how we've done work in the past is different. And how do we change the workforce to make sure that we bring people along and to educate them? Um, ironically, yesterday I was out at a, a plant um, and we, I asked about the workforce and they are concerned as well. And they said, it particularly in California, we need to bring the high school children up, the students up uh, to make sure that they understand a technology, show them new software items. Uh, we need to make sure that our community colleges are ready to take some of these students on. Um, community colleges in the past, in California at least, has been a place that people get their first steps before going to a university. And they kind of make their path there. But we need to change that idea. We need to make sure we have more on-hands, um, technology-driven education formats for those students. So um, those are some of the things that, um, that we're, I, I'm going to be working on this year. Um, but quite frankly, you know, it starts when the, kid, the, the students are young. And that's how we're going to be able to change our workforce. Um, Uh, there's many people that are now re trying to retool themselves and many people are, are just leaving the workforce totally because it's just too difficult for them to get on track. Uh, technology, broadband and equity is to me is the number one thing that we need to work on uh, for our, our students, for our job creation, for agriculture, uh, you name it, th this is the way we're going. Thank you so much, Cecilia, and I believe you do have to leave in one or two thank minutes. You. So I want to thank you for being here today and for joining us. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate everything, and let's continue to work together. Thank you. Uh, let us now take a closer look at the topic of uh, mobility. Joschka, uh, when it comes to new mobility solutions, what potential do you see for digitalization and AI to really make our cities and rural communities more resilient? Maybe you could share some experiences from your state or even best practices. Yeah, I would like to, um, because um, there are actually some pretty interesting um, projects going on in, in, in our state. I mean, just, just to bring it into context, yeah, Schleswig-Holstein is um, pretty small and we are not that rich. So um, if you take a look at the numbers, Christian just um, mentioned uh, 3.5 billion in, in AI and digitization, we spend 1% of that on AI in, um, in a special fund at the moment. So 35 million is not that much. Nonetheless, we've got some pretty interesting projects going on in Schleswig-Holstein and they reach from setting up a new digital infrastructure for autonomous driving, for example. There are projects in the very rural areas near the Danish border um, where we try to train um, autonomous buses, for example. We've got our small islands, you probably know Zylt, um, and the West Coast where there is an autonomous bus driving. Um, so that those are chances of AI because those are new 
ways of mobility and, and public transportation, but there are also new ways of, of shared mobility in our very rural communities. For example, there's one um, yeah, community of, of, um, of um, small villages um, where they have got a platform. Um, so they, there's one village owning one um, electronically um, uh, e-mobile and uh, one car. So those car can be rented by those people living in this village. And there's a digital platform to use and, 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 and borrow this car. So um, that is that is like just a small project, but it brings new opportunities to elderly people as well as very young people living in the rural areas because now they can like on Saturday drive to the market, which they were not able to do um, early on and younger people can like drive to the next town to go to a bar in the, in the late evening. So there, there are some very small projects where you don't need a big budget for, but they change the life of people by the use of digitization. And on the other hand, there are I don't, I guess I, I don't have to mention it. There are much bigger projects going on. EG, we are developed, there's a very, there are some very interesting projects here in Schleswig-Holstein developing autonomously driven um, ferries for um, the transport of people um, in um, lakes, in um, harbors and, and um, on rivers. So those are very interesting projects and they are only able to perform the, the techniques and to, to develop those um, solutions because we have got some um, yeah some very skilled personnel up here and because we've got some 5g um, networks who guarantee the transport of the data we need to drive a ferry autonomously so there are some interesting projects going on and i'm very sure there will be some you hear of in the future as well Thank you, Joschka, for, for sharing these ideas and initiatives. I would now like to dive deeper into the topic of uh, climate action. And Reuven, you have sponsored legislation on climate action in Washington state, um, among it the historic Climate Commitment Act. And you've also just participated in the COP meeting in Glasgow. And I want to ask you, what is the potential you see uh, for digitalization when it comes to climate protection? Um, and maybe you could also elaborate what you call supranational leadership Uh, of states, how you see uh, states, how you see the state's responsibility on these issues. Uh, thank you for raising this topic. I think we can all appreciate that in order to have even a remote chance of reaching 2050 net zero, that we need a serious deep decarbonization across all of our sectors, electricity, transportation, Uh, consumer behavior, density, urban growth, and so much more. Uh, the challenge of, of very serious sectors like aviation and maritime and global supply chain, by their very nature, are international in scope. So we need uh, international leadership and we need national leadership. And yet, on some very important level, it is the, what I call, supranational uh, levels of government that are actually achieving much of the progress, certainly in the United States. Uh, for example, so we have a deep decarbonization plan on transportation around biofuels, sustainable aviation, renewable hydrogen, and, and that's important to maritime, it's important to aviation, long haul trucking, uh, energy storage and industrial sectors. Uh, I think that was a theme out of Glasgow, which was the very difficult to decarbonize sectors need a serious strategy. Uh, you know, also, I think if you look at grid modernization and the movement from a handful of large power plants to a distributed energy system of renewables around wind, hydro, solar, a small modular nuclear, offshore wind, and so many others. So all of these are happening at the, at the supranational level. Uh, I think the, uh, the conversation in Glasgow was on some level easy to see as disappointing because of China and India, because of the lack of firm commitments to national uh, uh, proportional uh, reductions. Uh, and yet decarbonization is happening in many sectors at the supranational level. So uh, again, uh, sector-based as well as uh, economy-wide, 
Uh, carbon pricing is very important, which we now only have uh, two states in the United States, California, which has theirs, and Washington, which just passed legislation, and we expect to join California in the next two years. The role of, of data at the end of the day is just incredibly important to a radical transparency. I think data brings alive the reality of climate change. It brings alive the impact, not just in um, the equatorial belt, but worldwide and globally. And, and, uh, and it's so important. So to me, some of the most exciting applications in the world for high value, high impact uses of data is to bring alive for real people living real lives, a deeper understanding of the impact. Uh, and we have floods happening in our state right now in our northern uh, province of uh, British Columbia and Canada uh, that is just absolutely devastating. We're losing our salmon runs. So all of these impacts uh, and resiliency issues are tied to, to uh, increasing awareness and increasing action. So decarbonization is tied to data. Public awareness is tied to data. High quality, high impact policy, policy decisions are also tied to high value data. So that's some of the work that we're embarked on. Thank you, Ruben. Before I open it up to questions from the audience, if you have any, I want to focus on the topic of transatlantic cooperation. As part of the Laboratories of Democracy program, you have developed policy recommendations for the state level and also for potential transatlantic cooperation. We have already, already talked a lot about the state level, but not so much about transatlantic cooperation yet. Um, I do not want to get ahead of ourselves because the official publication is still outstanding, but I would like you to give us a little foretaste of what is to come. Um, could you please maybe share where you see potential for transatlantic cooperation when it comes to digitalization and specifically AI? And maybe let's start with our uh, German panelists for this question. Well, I think... Um, I think um AI has to be done in like an open innovation surrounding and you, nobody will be successful if you make a close shop in AI research and development. And um, besides the question of regulation, uh, which is really, really important, uh, I want to mention and I want to point out that we do need a, um, a culture of... Um, open innovation and collaboration in, in, in basic research and in, in deep research. And we're trying to do this. It's not, uh, I said we have a competition uh, in, uh, in front and um, we have a competition all around the world and we have a competition with our uh, friends in Bavaria of who gets the uh, most innovative people around for AI research. But um, But the core of it, of it is, I think, um, we have to build networks and we have to build networks on AI research and development, and which is value-based in like a, say, like Western values. I think there are still Western values and I think uh, we share um, a lot of values in our transatlantic um, relations and with our friends. Um, Uh, in the States and it differs uh, from other regions in the world. And uh, that's the biggest thing that we are doing. We have our, as, uh, and I'm glad you came over, um, the, uh, the Cyber Valley as uh, the biggest research uh, network in AI in, in Europe, not the biggest in the world, but, but in Europe. And it's not about, um, well, go and drive to Tübingen and Stuttgart and you have all of it. It's about um, to, to establish an open network, um, which is high end, which needs a lot of money from public and private, but um, which needs um, um, the spirit of being open from people who have roots from all over the world, from Europe, from the States, uh, from some <laughs> from other regions and um, that we do AI, the changes that AI can get can can lead to um, in a context um, which which is based on open societies and Western values 
and this is what we really do want to do the next years. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Christian, over to you. Yeah, I totally agree with that what Andrea said. So I think we need these networks um, and I'm very grateful that um, Aspen Institute started this program for lawmakers on the state level, but we need it in a broader sense. We need it on, in, in, in science and research. And um, I think what Andrea said, um, it's about values. Yeah, maybe we are we do not totally agree in every sense how AI or data should be regulated. But I think when it comes to the question, uh, what are the ruling global standards? We, we have to see that we are in a very hard and tough competition with China. And that's, I think, the point um, when it comes to the values of the Western world or in a, in a, on a, in a transatlantic sense uh, of the Western world. So what we need is to discuss these standards, even if they do not come directly into law or into regulation. But we need a big and broad discussion about the ethics of AI and about maybe also regulatory standards in a, in a global Western sense based on our values. And um, uh, I will end with one very important point for me personally as a lawmaker and politician, I think we also have to focus on the uh, security of all AI applications. So we are now living in a world when, where, where cyber attacks uh, are growing every day. And it's a very big challenge uh, for, for, for all governments, uh, for all administrations, uh, when, it, when they have to deal with critical infrastructure, that they focus on how to protect these infrastructures. And I think when it comes to AI and AI-based decision-making, for example, that's a very uh, tough challenge that we uh, do everything in order to protect these systems. And therefore, we need a very strong transatlantic relationship of our and 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 a very strong uh, transatlantic cooperation of our even our intelligence services and all security administrations we have in our countries. Thank you, Joshka. Over to you. I just want to add one or two thoughts. It's I mean to to, to um, get those things together. Um, America or the United States of America, North and North America and, and Europe are two of the most important, strongly connected value based markets of the world. So for the use of AI and digitization, economy wise, as well as state wise, a shared understanding of that, of, of what we are dealing with and what we want to work with is truly necessary. And therefore, I guess what is most important overall is that we talk together, that we exchange views, experiences, ideas, and therefore like meetings as we have them today or as we had with our labs of democracy are what is key to developing new solutions on both sides of the um, Atlantic. And I guess we can do that. So thank you very much for doing that. Thank you. And Ruven, uh, over to you for the American perspective on this transatlantic cooperation topic. It is absolutely essential on every level. And uh, I think uh, many uh, Americans feel a deep sense of, um, uh, of humility about uh, the disequilibrium in our country in the last uh, four years. Uh, and the recent changes uh, relative to uh, the lack of uh, appreciation and, and historical understanding and, and policy depth, but really values alignment with not just sort of NATO as an institution, but the broader uh, business and community and civic and student and cultural connections and relationships. And so I think uh, it's been a time of disequilibrium. And I think as we sort of move past that and, and uh, re-engage in the global community in a much more authentic and substantive way that I think that the transatlantic relationship is, the, is really the anchor 
of that entire framework. Uh, and I think it's values based and uh, on every level. And I think we have to be very real about acknowledging the fragility of some of our institutions. And uh, I think it was a, a, a time of, uh, of deep reflection in the United States relative to uh, the gratitude and appreciation for the stability of some of the critical elements of the transatlantic relationship. So I feel very strongly that uh, uh, that we're uh, in an, in a, entering a new phase, but there's a sensitivity to the vulnerabilities that do exist with uh, the, the growing uh, elements of, uh, of populism in the United States and around the world. Thank you, Ruben. And before we are closing our panel, I just want to see if there are any questions here from our audience in the room. Yeah, I see one over there. If we can get a microphone over there. Hi, uh, uh, thanks very much. It was fantastic, all of your interventions. Although I have to say, as someone who grew up in Illinois, I'm very sorry that the Illinois person isn't here. Um, uh, not least because uh, it's easy to forget that not every uh, state in America is, is uh, uh, Washington or California. And in fact, in 2016, when uh, North Carolina's uh, uh, legislature voted uh, after a Democrat had been elected governor, voted, uh, changed the law such that the governor didn't get to do anything uh, before the governor was uh, brought in. It was, we found out that like a third of American states have extremely low levels of democracy on the scale of like Cuba and Iran. And so, which, you know, so I, I'm not, I don't want to joke about that. I, this thing about the supranational thing, as, as an American myself, as someone from Illinois, I'm fascinated by what the EU is doing in terms of facilitating at the sort of the nation state level, this harmonization. So you were talking before about the legislative challenges um, that, that uh, states have uh, in America without going to the federal level, but the coordinating on things that are state powers. And I know the German, I don't know enough about the German legislation, but I know it's kind of uh, also similar in that coordination. So is there ever times when you look at coordinating or harmonizing across states without, you know, on, on the powers that the state is supposed to have? And so don't only throw things up to the federal, but actually try to look at sort of an EU-inspired <laughs> or uh, coordination model within, within and between states. Uh, Th thank you so much, and uh, you're exactly right that, uh, that both the strengths and the weaknesses of a federated system relative to the role of states is incredibly uh, nuanced and important. I would say that in some areas, particularly climate action, there is a deep sense of alignment at a regional level. So in the West Coast of the United States, we have, uh, or and in Canada, of course, we have British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, and California that have formed a Pacific Coast Collaborative. And we're coordinating everything from building standards to hydrofluorocarbons to uh, maritime and other sectors. So there are regional examples. The Midwest is very strong at uh, some of that coordination. It is very important uh, as, a, as a framework and also moves uh, federal action as well when regions get together uh, and the 50 states. But you're absolutely right that there are areas where the dark side and, and uh, the destructive side of state level authority over elections and other uh, categories is uh, shown to be uh, deeply hypocritical relative to uh, lack of access and lack of equity and lack of recognition of the, uh, the ubiquity uh, that should exist uh, in access to democracy, which fundamentally does not in some states. Thank you. Unfortunately, our time is up. So I want to thank you, Joschka, Andrea, Christian, and Ruben very much uh, for being here today and for joining us. I think this discussion has underlined that transatlantic exchange on digitalization and AI is very important. Um, and to end this, I just want to say what I've personally learned in Stuttgart as, as well from one of our fellow participants, Assembly Member Mark Berman from California, is that we should not be afraid to copy good ideas. And I think that's a very, very good uh, yeah, note to end this on. So thank you very much to our panelists for joining and thank you for everyone here for being here. And with this, I'm going to give the floor back uh, to our director, Stormy. Thank you.
Thank you so very much uh, for this wonderful panel discussion and the moderation. This was perfect. This ends the first day um, of our AI um, conference. We have a really exciting program tomorrow, so join us again. Um, we will hear from Gabriela what you have been up to with regard to AI and ethics. Um, we will have the opportunity to talk with the uh, chief scientist from the uh, WHO on health and artificial intelligence. We can do a deep dive on inequalities in artificial intelligence. Um, and we also want to look at uh, sustainability and AI and education, um, not to forget that very, very important um, topic. So join us again um, tomorrow. We are looking forward to seeing you, hopefully some of you in person again, um, and many of you also digitally. This has been a very rich day. Thank you so much, and also for my um, team, who worked really, really hard in the background because this has been, I mean, this has been not an easy conference. Um, so thank you so much. See you tomorrow. And our speakers are, um, and partners are also invited to dinner um, in a few minutes. Um, and for everybody else, hope to see you soon.